Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, no, it's oh. okay. Good to see. This is just so much. Is it fine? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to the second day of the research workshop titled Multiple Voices, Multiple Temporalities Imaginaries of Cultural and Global Political Resistance, which is organized with the uh, within the collaborative research project Globe Exchange Models and Practices of Global Cultural Exchange and Non Align Movement Research in the Spatial Temporal Cultural Dynamics which is conducted by the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and at the Institute of Art History in Zagreb, Croatia. So same as yesterday, uh, the meeting is being held on Zoom with registered participants, but it is also live streamed via YouTube. Uh, we will again have two sessions as yesterday with two lecture, lectures in each session, and there will be a 15 minute break between the sessions uh, on, as yesterday. As we have gone uh, quite a bit behind the schedule yesterday, I kindly ask you to keep an eye on the time frame that each presentation has, which is 45 minutes, and leave some 15 minutes for discussion and questions. Uh, to ask a question or make a comment, pre uh, press the raise your hand icon or write comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, due to limited bandwidth, we are kindly asking you to turn off your cameras and sound. Uh, unless you're commenting or posing questions. Uh, the online workshop will be re recorded for the, for the project's internal use and uh, reports. Thank you. And now I will pass the floor and word to Sanya. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to greet everyone again. Um, I want to mention just uh, one thing uh, that uh, those of you who were following us yesterday, uh, could notice that um, Professor Kolesnik uh, is not with us uh, here today. She uh, had a, a, a little bit of a problem, but she will be, uh, and she is here with us. Uh, uh, not, she's not in the room uh, at the Institute, but uh, in her uh, home. Um, so for a little uh, introduction again, for those of you who were not here yesterday and for all of us uh, as a, some kind of a resume and, um, and the introduction to today's uh, part of the workshop. Um, so through these two day uh, research workshop, uh, we, uh, with invited lecturers, we are particularly interested in gaining insights into correlations between and possible connections across networks and culture and political solidarity operating outside uh, of a non-aligned uh, movement geocultural geo space or at the point of it intersections which we talked a lot about yesterday with key sites of anti-colonial resistance the workshop is aimed at strengthening common common understanding and promoting cooperation among researchers with different disciplinary and theoretical backgrounds as well as clarifying the conditions for general application of their specific methodologies, which we are very much interested in, within the described thematic focus of the GLOBE Exchange project. So through the workshop, we, uh, um, yeah, although this workshop was organized thematically around different cultural phenomena in uh, these four sessions in two days, such as new biennial, biennial perennial exhibitions, new approaches to museum or cultural heritage, new magazines and popular media that functions as points of inter encounter and cultural exchange in between those networks. We saw already yesterday how much these phenomena are actually entangled um, and uh, how much are they inseparable uh, when we are discussing them. Some of the topics that we, will, uh, that we will be presented and discussed today, such as the cultural politics, uh, as well as personal networks that oppose, defied, or challenged the imperial politics within the Cold War context, or appropriation of existing exhibi exhibiting models to affirm and advocate for, our, for an alternative progressive ideas of culture and, and socioeconomic order, we believe will come to the fore again in today's lectures. lectures. We are very much looking forward to look again into the relevance of political events such as the Cuban Revolution for the conception of uh, cultural politics in the Latin America, for example, as we will see from Elodie Lebo talk about the discourse and the networks of actors involved in the Museo de Solidaridad, 
and the cultural strategy aimed at building an alternative model to Pan-Americanism. We will also, again, look at uh, the place and the role of Yugoslavia as the only European non-aligned country in such global movements as Jelena Vesic and Darika Popmitic will present with their case study of the Brigada Salvador Allende in Belgrade and the Week of Latin America, asking the question whether solidarity can be expressed beyond commemorative agendas. In the second session, which uh, will uh, take place, a place after a 15 minute break, Hala Halim will um, again come back, bring us back to the Arabian, Arabian context in her presentation on a trilingual Arabic, English and French anthology of uh, poetry published by the Afro-Asian Writers Association in 1971 in the Lotus Journal. While uh, Isabel Plante will discuss the circulation of the new visual language in the Cold War context, that is on the links between the Cuban poster designers and the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw Design School. So I will uh, now uh, give uh, my word again to Tihana, who will chair uh, the first session. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, it is my great pleasure to... Is okay? Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> um, it is my great pleasure to moderate today's first session. Uh, which is centered on the gestures of international artistic solidarity during the 70s, as uh, Sanya already mentioned. And I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, that is Elodie Lebo. Elodie is a PhD candidate in art history at the University of Toulouse de Jean Jaurès, and in, uh, in history at the Institute of History of the Pontificia Universidad Católica uh, de Chile. I hope I did not butcher this completely. Uh, she's a member of a research center, France, America, Spain. Her investigations focus on the collection and the political and artistic networks developed by the Museo de la Solidaridad from 71 to 73, created in Chile during the uh, government of popular unity and the, Museo, and the Museo Internacional de la Resistencia Salvador Allende from 75 to 91. Her doctoral thesis is entitled The Odyssey of the Museo de la Solidaridad Salvador Allende. Uh -huh. A transnational cultural history of Chile from the popular unity to the return from exile from 71 to 91. She also teaches and researches at the University of Toulouse de Jean Jaurès as a temporary attache. She's the author of articles in academic journals and books, and she also co curated with Charles Esch at the exhibition The Lost Museum as a part of the Contemporary Art Festival of Fantôme de Septembre in Toulouse in 2016. Uh, her presentation is entitled The Museo de la Solidaridad, Chile 71 to 73, an alternative to the Pan American cultural policy. Elodie, uh, the screen is yours. <laughs> Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank the organizer of this seminar for their invitation. I'm pretty sorry for my bad English. I guess I'm going to honor the reputation that we have French people abroad for not knowing to handle languages, but I promise I will do my best. So today I will present you a part of my research as a PhD candidate in history of art and history at the University of Toulouse en Jaurès and the Instituto de Arte of the Universidad Católica de Chile concerning the first stage of Museo de la Solidaridad history when it has been created during the government of Popular Unity in Chile led by Salvador Allende. I used to present this slide uh, when I speak about the history of Museo de la Solidaridad. Why? Uh, because it serves to understand the three stages which correspond each one with a particular historical context and localization. After the coup d'etat of the September 11th of uh, 73 by General Pinochet, it was recreated, this museum in exile, for the name of Museo Internacional de la Resistencia Salvador Allende between 75 and 90. New artworks have been collected and itinerant exhibition were organized in several countries of the world to denounce the dictatorship until the progressive return of democracy in Chile uh, from uh, 1901. This third stage correspond to the recuperation of the work from outside, but also from inside of Chile, which were confiscated by the military after the coup and 
It corresponds also to the inauguration of the actual Museo de la Solidar Salvador Allende. Here you have um, an actual uh, picture of um, the headquarters. As you can see, there were uh, three uh, very different stages and uh, therefore three institutional institutional names in the space of only 20 years. But today we will looking into the first step only. The emergence of uh, such uh, projects occur in the context marked by the Cold War. Of course, as you know, the recent uh, historiography showed the limits of a bipolar and binary analysis of this conflict. I especially think about the work of Odo Westad, the Cold War Third World Intervention in the Making of Our Time of 2006, or is more recent, the Cold War a World History of 2070s, which replaced the central protagonism of Third World countries and organization in this late and complex conflict. Within the non-aligned actors, Allende's Chile was particularly active in the research of a democratic way uh, to reach socialism, what we know as the Via Chileno al Socialismo. The issues raised by the recent transnational history help us to understand the intimate relation which exists between the national scale and the global, but also the diversity of the actors directly or indirectly engaged in this conflict who was not only the state governments. On this topic, I invite you to read the collective book directed by the British historian Tanya Harmer and my PhD supervisor, Alfredo Riquelme Segovia, Chile y la Guerra Fría Global, Chile in the Global Cold War of uh, 2014, which deal with the role of the political parties from the direction to the basis, the masses organization and the transnational non-government organization and so on. In this global context of Cold War, some historians have been particularly interested in the specific dynamics of the American continents. Tanya Armer speaks about an inter-American Cold War. It's a period above all after the victory of the Cuban Revolution when United States sought to contain the advance of socialist and anti-imperialist ideas unfavorable to its interest and in its era of influence. Furthermore, after the cultural turn, some historians also consider the support uh, media of the ID's propagation as the review, the cinema, songs in this conflict. Arts have been privileged tools for promoting a certain model, worldview, and universe of values. In 1999, Francis Turner Sanders speaks of a cultural Cold War to describe this strategy of soft power. Designed to uh, conquer the human minds in our book, The Cultural Cold War, the CIA and the World of Arts and Letters. However, beyond the simple uh, issues of the Cold War, some historians replace this search for US influence over Latin American in a perspective of long continuity with respect to cultural diplomacy ascribed to the good neighbor policies. Eduardo Rey, in this contribution to the collective book La Guerra Fria Cultural in America Latina of 2012, suggests that in Latin America, the cultural Cold War began during the 30s and the Roosevelt era for figures such as uh, Rockefeller or organization of the Office of the Coordinator of the Inter-American Affair created in 1940. In the same wave, Claire Fox published a book in 2013 where she studied the cultural policy of United States for the visual art unit of the Secretariat of the Organization of American States, commonly known as Pan American Union between uh, 48 and 70. My PhD investigation are part uh, of uh, this epistemological and methodological renewal of Cold War studies, which seeks to highlight uh, its cultural dimension and the role of the Chilean Unidad Popular within. By presenting the discourse and the networks of actors involved in the Museo de la Solidaridad, we will ask us today was it is possible to consider the Museum of Solidarity as an alternative project to Pan Americanism? First, I want to present you. Uh, the background, uh, the uh, Pan-American hegemony in Latin America after the Second, Co the Second World War. For its 
advocates Pan-Americanism is a movement which aims to facilitate trade, cultural exchange, and diplomacy relations between the state of the entire American continent. As we said, Pan-Americanism spirits lied in the heritage of the good neighbor policy promoted by Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s, which was the idea that the United States would not interfere in the affairs of other American countries committing to promote reciprocal and fraternal exchange with them. Now, there is the theory and there is a praxis. According to Claire Fox, who studied the foundational document of the OAS, culture is seen as an instrument to prepare the ground for liberal values to take root in the American republics. And what better way to do this than for the development of the art market combined with discourses promoting the depolitization of arts. The decades from the 40s to 70s are marked by the progressive penetration and hegemony of the US market supported by the Pan-American cultural programs promoted after 48 by the Organization of American States and based on the patronage of foundation of the North American companies. Inside in this transnational organization, the visual art unit directed by the Cuban lawyer and art critics Jose Gomez Sicre was dedicated especially at the development of cooperation, institutions, speeches and reviews around arts. This section after the Cuban revolution intensified its effort with the creation of the Salon ESO of young artists in 64, uh, which organized the exhibition of paintings and sculpture for young people under the age of 40, which was financially supported by the ESO company. The young Latin American prize winning artists were held after in the gallery of the Pan American Union. I put a, a picture in Washington. It was clearly also a way uh, to keep young artists away from the networks that Cuba was developing in Latin America in the same moment. Claire Fox has shown how this institution mediated between North American investment in Latin America and the artists of the region by promoting an artistic policy aimed at combating um, fraud, the promotion of lyric and expressionist abstraction, committed art, social realism in particular, and the influence of the Mexican school of painting in inherited from muralism and the discourses that surrounded these artics, artistic productions. The expressionist abstraction, uh, of the West was symbol of the free market, freedom of thought and creativity of capitalism as opposed uh, to the dogma of social realism, uh, whether it's, uh, it is Soviet or Mexican, no matter the difference. But at the scale of America, the artistic discourses promoted the idea of a supposed existence of a supranational affective community that would not be fostered by nations a kind of hemispheric citizenships, as qualified by the professor David Louis Brown. The mercantile vision, free trade and anti-nationalist position in arts of the OAS was deployed in the reviews Boletin de Musica y Arte Visuales between uh, 50 and 56, and then uh, Boletin de Artes Visuales between uh, 57 and uh, 73, edited by uh, Jose Gomez Sicre and the Pan American Union. In this scenario, there was a real difficulty in bringing institution out of Latin America outside the circuits or without the help of non-American inversions because these networks were present everywhere in the museum, university, foundations, and so on. In the Cuban revolution, uh, in that sense, was a real turning point because it developed its own institutions to promote cultural cooperation with the other people of Latin America throughout its own values. Casa de, la Mer de las Americas was created in uh, 59, the same year of the revolution, precisely for this purpose to remedy this lack of visibility of the continent's artists by organizing artistic events, including competition and then biennials at regular intervals. 
the idea was to exhibit work of art, but not only. It was also necessary to create the condition of a real dialogue between creators around their aesthetic, but also political and social conceptions. As summarized in this statement, on the one hand, it projects outside Cuba in the Latin American sphere the best artistic, literary, plastic, and over expression created by Cubans. And on the other hand, it collects the same expression from the brotherly people of Latin America in order to disseminate them among the Cuban people. Furthermore, Casa de las Americas, which edited its own eponym review, participated to the promotion of dependency theory, which arose in Latin America in the 60s. For a lot of left-wing intellectuals from Latin America in this decade, Pan-Americanism sounds more as a manoeuvre that allows the United States to lock the so-called Southern country into a form of economic dependence that prevents their, de their development. To counteract this hegemonical model, Casa de las Americas began to explore and define Latin identity in order to promote, in the world of the Chilean intellectual Miguel Rojas Mix, um, an aware, uh, awareness of the common destiny shared by the people of the continent. During the numerous meetings organized by Casa de las Americas, in which a socialist and sovereign vision of art were discussed, the mercantile option was denounced and uh, a politicized culture committed to Latin American revolutionary processes was promoted. This led to a new conception of what revolutionary art, revolutionary art pardon, should be in the context of the implementation of socialist processes in this geographical and cultural area. This developing, um, developing regional awareness served to the creation of a new infrastructure whose pillars would be non-markets, as well as configuring a new model of international cooperation inscribed in a non-capitalist vision of the world. Of course, Salvador Allende and this coalition of Unidad Popular shared this vision. As we can read in the program of Popular Unity, I quote, the social process that begin with the triumph of the people will go hand in hand with a new culture oriented toward the consideration of human work as the, as the highest value. The expression of the will to assert oneself and national independence and the formation of a critical vision of reality. If the majority of intellectual and artists are already fighting today against the cultural deformation of capitalist society, in the new society, they will have a vanguard world to continue their action. The new culture will not be created by decree. It will emerge from the struggle for fraternity against individualism, for national values and against cultural colonization, for the access of the popular masses to arts, literature and the means of communication and against their commercialization. So after the election of Salvador Allende as president of the Republic on the September 4th of 70, diplomatic relations between Chile and Cuba were re-established and Cuba was able to have an ally in the subcontinent facilitated by the opening of an air route uh, from Santiago to Havana. In this context, the Instituto de Arte Latinoamericano sought to develop cultural theory and praxis comparable to those of the Casa de las Americas. As Carla Machiavello and Silvia uh, Juliana Suarez wrote, these two institutions, Casa de las Americas and the uh, Instituto de Arte Latinoamericano, should be understood as two poles as a cultural program with a continental projection that initiated new form of artistic engagement. The Havana exhibition, uh, the first edition of the Cuba-Chile Cuba Biennial, uh, in uh, 71, jointly organized by the Instituto de Arte Latinoamericano and Casa de las Americas, was the occasion for the exchange in that sense of collection of modern arts between the two countries. Later, the Cuban work became part of the Museo de la Solidaridad, while those uh, from Chile were incorporated into the Galleria de Arte Latinoamericano uh, of the Casa de las Americas. 
the statements by Miguel Rojas Mix and Adelaida de Juan uh, on the significance of these events, which was published in the Casadas Americas Review, sum us, sum up, pardon, <laughs> perfectly the over social cultural model uh, advocated by these two revolutionary oriented governments, both of their own country and for Latin America as a whole. They said, for the first time in the history, of Latin America, two countries are joining their forces to hold an exhibition in which they gave each other works. Of course, many artists had already donated their work to museum and collection, but an attitude like this, which reflects uh, an awareness of solidarity between peoples, had never been seen before. What does this mean? In our opinion, the significance of these events is very important in the process of the artist disalienation and in understanding what the artist can contribute to Latin American culture. The artist who works for the market transform his work into an exchange value and participate in the maintenance of the statu quo of the bourgeoisie, who is able to acquire these goods. In contrast, here, the artist work uh, directly for the people since his work is destined to become part of the public domain of two countries, which themselves lack artistic wealth. In this way, this encounter brings to light another reality, the Latin American cultural poverty due to the lack of purchasing power that all countries have to acquire cultural goods. There is no doubt that none of us in is in a favorable economic condition to acquire a collection such as is necessary for the formation of a great museum. With action of this type, however, we can begin to collect work in various regions of Latin America and put them at the service of the formation of artistic skills of masses. Sorry for the quote, it's uh, large, but I think it's really significant uh, in that sense. So to come back to uh, the Museum uh, of Solidarity, Museo de la Solidaridad project, it was born in April 71 in Santiago de Chile during, during the operation, uh, Operation Verdad, Truth Operation, an international meeting of intellectual and journalists organized by the government of uh, Unidad Popular to counteract the counter-information campaigns carried out by the Chilean right-wing opposition with the financial support of the CIA. The Spanish art critic, Jose Maria Moreno Galvan, proposed the idea of asking artists from all over the world to offer work in solidarity with the government of Salvador Allende. The initiative was received with enthusiasm uh, by the president uh, of Chile. As a result of this meeting, a dozen personalities from the art board from uh, the Comité Internacional de Solidaridad Artística con Chile, uh, the Artistic Solidarity International Com Committee, presided by the Brazilian art critics Mario Pedrosa. Their objective was to establish the foundation of a future experimental museum of modern art and contemporary art for the Chilean people by soliciting the artists of the world for the donation of one or more of their work. For the art critic Jacques Lenart, it seemed that there were at least two museum projects. The one conceived by Miguel Rojas Mix with a continental Latin America and anti-US perspective, uh, as we could see uh, with uh, the uh, Cuba Chile Biennal, and the, the other one by Pedrosa, uh, which was more international and more experimental. Indeed, if we look closely, uh, Miguel Rojas Mix objective uh, within the Instituto de Arte Latinoamericano was to create a Latin American art museum, while, Mi while Mario Pedrosa was more inclined toward a museum of modern and experimental art. The Museum of Solidarity was inaugurated on uh, May uh, 70s of uh, 72 in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santiago, on the occasion of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the UNCTAD-3, which is uh, a United Nations program uh, designed to help the development of the economies that are most backward according to the indicators of the same organization. For Allende, it was very important that the museum uh, can be inaugurated on this date as evidenced by the letter he sent in August uh, 1971 to Jose Maria Moreno Galvan, in which he said that 
it will be very significant if the Museum of Modern Art project, uh, as you see for the moment, it doesn't have the name of Museo de la Solidaridad, could be inaugurated during this conference. It will demonstrate the solidarity of progressive artists around the world with our political process. And he gave an interesting data uh, for the investigator when he writes that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is charged with the national embassies to manage the sending of the artwork. Organized in the Chilean capital at the same time at this major international meeting, the first exhibition of uh, the museum welcomed delegation from over a hundred country. 100,000 people visited the, the exhibition. Uh, it's a considerable number for Chile at the time. And uh, on the occasion of the inauguration, Salvador Allende gave a speech and thanked the artists of the world. I quote, I'm particularly moved by this noble contribution to the process of transformation that Chile has launched in order to assert its sovereignty, to mobilize its resources and to accelerate the material and spiritual development of its people. These are the conditions for moving towards socialism, which was chosen by the people with full awareness of their destiny. It looks evident here that Salvador Allende government saw artistic and cultural initiatives as a good way of counteracting the national and international propaganda campaigns against it. The Museo de la Solidaridad is particularly significant of this cultural diplomacy. This extract uh, showed the strong media potential of this museum for the Chilean president. Um, I really liked the discussion uh, of yesterday, so I wanted to contribute to the debate, showing you the mascot of the Museo de la Solidaridad first exhibition, the Juan Miro Wooster, as you can see um, here, uh, which was a hit um, with the press and exhibition organizer. Um, in a certain way, uh, I agree with you um, when um, uh, we spoke about uh, the desire uh, of uh, uh, the third world uh, contribution to legitimize uh, initiatives uh, by the promotion of artists from the Western world. Here it's a clear example. Um, this universal, universal vision of arts and creation reflects the liberal political and cultural thinking of Salvador Allende. But it's really different from the Pan-American policy precisely for its non-market character. What is particularly interesting about this museum is that it has no acquisition policy over than that of donations. Even uh, Mario Pedrosa would like to have works by internationally renowned artists and he cannot really control who is going to offer on that work or not. We have documents which testify that Pedrosa invited, for example, Fernando Gamboa, the vice director of Mexico National Institute of Fine Arts, to organize an exhibition in Santiago because in this world, he wants to complete the Mexican participation with, with work by several other other great artists, starting with Tamayo, Geritz, and others. From the point of view of the artist, the act of donation is shared with a particular symbolism. As we could see here with the declaration of uh, Claude Lazare uh, during an interview in Paris in uh, 2016, he say, giving a work was not a meaningless act. It was an act of commitment. As young painters, we wanted to make a revolution and change the world. Being an artist is not about making beautiful decorations. Painting is a commitment to oneself. Giving an artwork is part of this commitment. By giving a work of art, you commit yourself to different degrees depending on the person. This is a part of the work uh, of an artist or an intellectual in general to express himself, to support just political causes and bring ID into the world. Indeed, uh, the French uh, art historian uh, Jean-Luc Chalumeau wrote that the system, the capitalist system, can support, absorb and recuperate everything except the free gift of creativity to all by a free artist. This initiative, furthermore, uh, was not destined to remain limited to Chile, as was the socialist revolution. 
if we are to believe Mario Pedrosa words to uh, Giulio Carlo uh, Argan uh, in July uh, 31 of uh, 72, he said, the success of this experiment will also count for the artistic future of the world. I personally believe that the future of art is conditioned uh, by the international future of the socialist experiment in the world, of which the modest Chilean model is the most recent and certainly the most meaningful example. So to conclude, um, I will say that the victory of the Cuban re revolution and the creation of the Casa de las Americas really allowed the consolidation and emergence of alternative, or, and, uh, alternative intellectual, politic, political and artistic networks aimed at combating the economic and cultural dependence from the US. Indeed, the Pan-American policy of patronage and privatization of larger sections of the artistic sector promoted by the OAS were in total contradiction with the cultural programs that were to be defended by the Cuban and later Chilean socialist governments, which sought to develop public institutions less or more linked to the power of the state, as well as public policy at the service of the democratization of creation and access to art. However, the Museo de la Solidaridad did not turn its back on North, North American or Western artists, but on the capitalist networks of art that structure relations of domain, domination. Um, it's presenting itself as an uh, ex nihilo institution, which was able to count on the contribution of Western Bloc, Eastern Europe, and country of the South. For all what we say today, I think we can speak about a socialist and internationalist museum which wanted to dialogue not only with the South, but with all the actors and institutions from all around the world who support the experience of the Chilean way to socialism. I hope I could demonstrate how this museum, never seen before in the world, has succeeded in going beyond the thought patterns of its time by working at the national, the regional, and the international scale. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was an incredibly interesting and rich presentation. Uh, and I would have, of course, many questions, but I would first like to see if there are any questions from the audience. Well, since I don't, yes, uh, Miguel has a question. So uh, Miguel, please. Oh, thank you very much, Lodi. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, this is a great uh, uh, presentation because it shows uh, in a parallel dimension how uh, the project of uh, solidarity uh, was uh, simultaneously uh, growing uh, on the shadow of, uh, in this case, uh, the Pan American policies or the policies of uh, uh, dependence, economic dependence, and the growth of uh, neoliberal policies in, in, in Latin America. And, and it's an experiment across the world, right? We, we see uh, the case of Chile as the country that reaches uh, socialism through democracy uh, and a clear attempt. Uh, to create, uh, you know, another node on this uh, network of uh, uh, potential uh, alternatives to the ideas of uh, progress and development, but at the same time holding on institutions like the United Nations, UNESCO, uh, and hosting, as Cuba did, uh, these massive conferences that had in their titles uh, economy, uh, culture and uh, progress <laughs> or development. It's, it's, uh, you will say that this is a little um, contradictory, and and Elodie had had said that right, or or, or uh, figures like uh, uh, Pedrosa, for example, uh, who uh, op is openly a critic. Uh, uh, let's say of a leftist uh, tendencies in in, Bra in Brazil, but he is uh, the person that uh, leads uh, the Sao Paulo Biennale, uh, and the Sao Paulo Biennale is a construct of uh, a right wing uh, uh, in institutional uh, uh, 
uh, and supported by industrialists uh, uh, since the 1950s. Uh, uh, that Biennale, we know it as part of the creation of a big market, not only collections. Then we, we see these contradictions or, or this parallel um, paths going through, right? Uh, the fact that uh, Jose Gomez Sicre is a Cuban American uh, pre revolutionary that will uh, impulse uh, this possibility of, of an art that is apolitical, but that is completely political because it's controlled by uh, uh, these uh, new markets, right? It's, 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 it's directed to construct institutions that are uh, part of the machinery of capitalism. Uh, and then you see the artist benefiting from that. And, and then we will we'll, we'll have to talk about artists uh, in, 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 in many of the modern uh, avant-garde, right? Who are both a communist openly, but also uh, benefiting from uh, the art market uh, created in, in, in the early 20th century. Uh, then it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how uh, these two discourses go back to back uh, and, and nurture it itself, one of dependency and other of independence, <laughs> uh, and the same people uh, playing on both sides, right? The, the role of, uh, uh, of Miguel Rojas Mix is very interesting as, as a clearly uh, voice uh, uh, in, in, in an independence, uh, Latin America and a Pan American vision, uh, uh, but he's a, uh, a lonely voice uh, that he will be just somehow uh, uh, be forgotten for many years. It's great that you are bringing him again uh, and to put him on the same stage with Pedrosa and Jose uh, on the secret. Thank you so much, Elodie. Great, great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miguel. Um, about uh, what you said, um, I think um, these persons um, was a, a real um, knowledge about the Marxist um, uh, uh, thinking. Uh, I don't know if I express me well, but um, they really uh, fought uh, the praxis uh, in relation of the theory and uh, the theory in relation of the praxis. Uh, they were, um, I think they shared a dialectical um, a vision uh, of the world and uh, of uh, their own practice. Uh, and it's for that reason, I guess it's interesting the bridge uh, they could, uh, they're able to, uh, to cross uh, between uh, these different uh, um, contexts, uh, revolutionary context, or uh, as you say, um, the United States uh, in Western um, official sphere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have two more questions. Uh, first, I would like to give uh, the, the floor to Gordana Jovanovic and uh, then uh, Sanya has a question as well. Thank you. Gordon, you would need uh, to unmute yourself. We can't, can't hear you, unfortunately. Don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, thank you very much for organizing uh, th uh, this workshop and uh, for all the lectures I, uh, I heard so far and uh, Elodie for your lecture. So may I use this opportunity um, to ask you, how, how would you uh, position the Museum of Human Rights in Santiago de Chile? I had the opportunity to visit that museum uh, in 1913. And I have to confess that I was quite uh, uh, confused. Somehow I was asking myself if anybody who uh, 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 didn't have uh, any knowledge about the broader context of events in Chile would be able to understand anything. Somehow um, I was disappointed probably also because I had 
higher expectations, knowing, of course, the meaning, the significance of uh, Salvador Allende's, Allende's pro uh, project and, and uh, the consequences. Of course, this happened in Chile. I mean, that museum and my visit happened in Chile, which as everywhere in, in the world is and so radically opposed to, to Allende's project. So what would you say about uh, uh, that museum? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a, a really interesting uh, question. Uh, I don't work uh, uh, about a human rights museum, but I have uh, uh, some opinion about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I will share it. Um, the Museum of Memory and Human Rights um, has to be understood as the culmination of the uh, uh, government's memorial policies, uh, which were led by the Consultation of Parties for Democracy, uh, which was a coalition of center and center left tendencies. Um, it was inaugurated in 2010 um, by uh, the President Michel Bachelet. And uh, effectively, it provides information on the crimes committed by the military dictatorships. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really speak about the project uh, which was posited uh, between Unidad Popular and uh, the dictatorship, and uh, uh, especially of the uh, neoliberal uh, turn uh, which uh, uh, permitted the, the dictatorship. So uh, effectively, uh, it's a volunteer, um, it's like a, a, um, a institution who wants to reconcile uh, a bit like uh, the political of uh, transition in Spain. It was uh, uh, quite similar, uh, which want to uh, conciliate um, uh, people uh, which uh, really have a completely different uh, vision of the world. Um, so uh, they are opposition. Uh, from the right <laughs> uh, of uh, the Chilean uh, political sphere, uh, we uh, they they they, um, they oppose it themselves to uh, what they say. Uh, it's uh, like a, a partial uh, vision of uh, uh, the history of uh, Chile because uh, they really think that uh, it was a, a bit necessary uh, for. Uh, Evite, no, for um, uh, combat fighting uh, the, the Marxist uh, um, introduction uh, in, in, in Chile. And you have uh, the opposition of the left uh, who say that uh, it's not uh, normal uh, to not speak about uh, effectively the, the project of Unidad Popular and uh, how the dictatorship really wants to destroy the, all uh, this heritage. So yeah, it's a museum. Uh, I think it's uh, important for investigators and for Chilean people because uh, they are uh, political of archives of documents and uh, they, are, uh, um, they are thinking about uh, some studies about uh, these uh, periods, but uh, this is criticized for that reason. But we can hope that uh, uh, in the future, it will uh, evolutionate it to uh, uh, speak about this uh, um, this infrastructure uh, transformation during the dictatorship. I hope I really reply to your question. Uh, Sonia? Unfortunately, like... I had uh, troubles with yeah. internet connection, okay. so I couldn't uh, uh, hear all uh, uh, you said, unfortunately. But thank you anyway. Yeah, it's I'm my sorry. connection I'm we, we, which has a problem? No, I think it's fine. I think your connection is uh, fine. Uh, Sanya, would you like to? Yes, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry that you had technical uh, problems that you couldn't hear the answer, but Maybe it will be as it is recorded. Uh, we can, we will have the the, the full uh, rec uh, recorded uh, session, so you could hear the answer afterwards, or exchange emails. Uh, so um, yes, uh, my my question um, or questions um, are um, related to uh, the policy of. Um, you were speaking a lot about uh, how the revolutionary government um, positioned themselves towards the uh, notion of culture. 
um, and um, uh, in the opposition to the uh, imperial um, Pan-Americanism. But um, um, the, the, the focus of your study obviously is uh, the museum and the notion of the museum, how it was reconfigured, um, reconceptualized in this um, particular context. But I'm wondering if you could tell us more uh, or if you were studying and uh, researching uh, on how um, other aspects of cultural production, but also uh, maybe uh, production that is more related directly re related to, uh, to politics, such as memory politics and public space, how they were addressed uh, in that uh, uh, period that you're researching in the period around the constitution of the museum. Were there any debates uh, over this kind uh, of uh, production? I'm talking about uh, particularly uh, monuments or a public uh, art. Um, and uh, I am uh, <laughs> approaching this uh, from uh, one uh, small, uh, uh, example or uh, a curiosity, it is the fact that uh, one of uh, Yugoslav um, uh, sculptors uh, who was very prominent in making monuments uh, was in Chile uh, at the end of 60s, early 70s, and he made uh, one commissioned monument and he got a, a commission for another one that was dedicated to a, a social protest from the 1920s. So I'm, um, uh, it is a very interesting uh, um, uh, anecdote, uh, uh, the fact also that this, uh, this artist uh, got uh, a solo exhibition in Chile uh, in uh, the National Museum, uh, in another museum, I don't, I, I'm not sure which one at the moment. Um, uh, but uh, so it's another question, uh, was there also a practice of uh, hosting uh, um, exhibitions from artists from uh, other socialist countries in that period. Um, thank you, Sancha, for for your 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 question. I'm sorry, I have on, uh, only the Spanish who is coming, so it's, it's difficult to speak in English um, about the the national. Uh, cultural policy uh, during uh, the Unidad Popular. Um, in the program uh, of the, the Unidad Popular, uh, it was, um, a pre, pre, uh, they wanted to install a, in, in a cultural institution. Um, I, I cannot remember now the name, uh, the exact name, uh, but they, they didn't have the time. Uh, three, uh, three years of uh, power is, uh, is um, really little. But uh, there were a, a lot of um, um, of debates uh, about of that, uh, saying that the government of Salvador Allende uh, didn't care about culture uh, as a, a, a vision of the the masses culture, uh, the popular culture. Um, but it's interesting uh, too to to see uh, that during the the the. the the UNCTA, the free uh, that we see uh, in the presentation, uh, there was a, a, a counter of uh, UNESCO uh, about uh, uh, the conception of, muse uh, of museum uh, in the 70s and the possibility for institution to compromise, compromise um, itself uh, with the, the people and the social transformation. And they developed uh, during uh, the, this in culture of Santiago de Chile, uh, the concept of integral museum. Uh, I don't know the the inheritance of uh, of that concept, but it's it, it, it could be interesting to to see uh, maybe oh Yugoslavian uh, too uh, and uh, all the actors of the world were uh, in, were compromised in um, in these discussions. Um, yeah, sorry, I cannot uh, reply uh, a lot about that, but um, uh, if I see something, I can send you. Thank you. Uh, if we have time, I would just have a brief question for you. Uh, well, uh, as far as I understood, all the donations were, uh, tar um, I mean, the, the whole concept of donating the works to the museum were targeted towards the international artists. But given the fact that cultural workers and artists were an important part of the Allende campaign, I was wondering what was the, the relationship between the museum and the local artistic community? How did they interact or respond? What was, um, what was the relation of the local scene towards the, 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 the campaigns for the museum? Um, 
I don't really didn't know uh, what was the, 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 the vinculation. I know that uh, the Instituto de Arte Latino Americano, um, which was the scene uh, where uh, I guess uh, the artists, uh, uh, visual artists uh, were uh, comprom compromised in the, this reflection of social transformation. Um, this Instituto um, uh, was charged about the uh, collection of uh, the, the artwork and the conservation of this artwork because uh, the Museum of Solidarity uh, didn't have the time to develop its own uh, institution. Uh, they wanted to, to make a, a center, a cultural center in the Parque O'Higgins, the uh, O'Higgins Parks, but uh, finally they, they didn't have the time. Um, but I know, uh, for example, during an interview that I have uh, with an artist, Irene Dominguez, uh, who has died today, uh, that uh, the, some uh, group of artists, a woman artist, uh, was uh, commissioned by uh, the government and the, the president's secretariat uh, for uh, making um, presents for the delegation of the diplomatic uh, uh, government. So this, I think it's uh, interesting to, to see uh, how the, the artists were considered uh, to, uh, by, uh, by the government, uh, like a tool, uh, to, we, we, we have to say it, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, its own relationship with, uh, with other countries. Thank you so much. And thank you, Elodie, for being here with us and for the wonderful presentation and discussion. Thank uh, you. And, and I would like to introduce uh, our, uh, the speakers of our second presentation, Jelena Vesic and Darinka Popmitic. Are you here? Do you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, mm, the, the title of, of our second presentation in this session is on the solidarity of Yugoslav people with the people of uh, Latin America, and it will be presented by Jelena Vesic and Darinka Popmitic. Uh, yeah, Darinka Popmitic is a Belgrade-based visual artist, and her work deals with the reconstruction of collective memories and their impact on art and politics, and vice versa. She traces reasons that particular actions, attitudes, or historical events move in or out of focus, and questions the role of art as it relates both to itself and wider social context. Trained as a painter, her works uh, range from street murals to installations involving or better said, centered on classical paintings and from public spaces to apartments or simulations thereof. Uh, Jelena Vesic, who is presenting the project with Darinka, is an independent curator, writer, editor, and lecturer. She's active in the field of publishing research and exhibition practice that intertwines political theory and contemporary uh, art. Uh, uh, Jelena Vesic co-curated lecture performance at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade and at the uh, Konischer Kunstverein, as well as the collective exhibition project Political Practices of Post-Yugoslav Art, with criti which critically examined art historical concepts and narratives on Yugoslav art after the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Uh, her recent book on neutrality with uh, Vladimir Yerich Vlidi and Rachel O'Reilly is part of the non-aligned modernity edition of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Jelena and Darinka with us. Mm, if mm, it's fine, okay. I lost my Zoom for a second, but you can jump in if everything is fine. Uh, hi, uh, do we hear Hello. you? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Super, uh, can you see us? Uh, we can see you and we can hear you. All right, and do you see uh, a slideshow uh, on, uh, on our screen? Uh, did we manage to share, to share the slideshow? 
Yes, yes, we can see the, your presentation. You, you can maybe just enlarge the presentation, but we can see everything. We can see your screen. Uh, okay, just a second uh, while uh, while we are getting help uh, of um, uh, our technical. our, <laughs> our uh, uh, technical assistant uh, and many more, uh, Vladimir. Uh, uh, I just wanted to use uh, this opportunity to thank uh, the the organizers, uh, the uh, I mean everyone who participated in this. Uh, uh, interesting series of uh, uh, debates uh, that uh, inspired us and uh, um, also uh, left us with um, with many with many questions known and uh, and unknown <laughs> and uh, I think uh, such considerations uh, we should uh, we should uh, we should we should continue and uh, okay uh, that this conference would be uh, just one cluster of, uh, of these uh, conversations. Here are Darinka and uh, myself. And actually, actually this entire um, story was uh, uh, picked up in a way by uh, an artist, by the artist, by Darinka Popmitic. And then I uh, continued uh, reflecting on uh, because I work with uh, many of uh, artists and with many of projects which considered uh, somehow uh, history and how do we historicize. So for me, this is also the question of artistic practice. And of course, uh, Darinka's practice is very much um, uh, based upon uh, this uh, entire complex uh, uh, methodology of uh, uh, memorizing uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, producing a political actualization uh, of the uh, uh, from uh, the past events. And uh, so we wanted uh, to start, uh, I mean, uh, our entire story is about, uh, is about solidarity, but um, uh, because actually the project or the projects, I don't know how should I say, uh, uh, that we are working on are very, are very complex. So we have to uh, zip this all into the time uh, we have, which is uh, in a way enough, in a way uh, it is not enough to go into all the details where we would uh, like to go. So we thought um, uh, to, uh, to start, uh, to start uh, uh, with a few comments on solidarity, uh, which Darinka will, um, Read. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jelena. Um, solidarity cannot make anyone happy because it is built upon pain and asks from us involvement and understanding the pain of others. And also solidarity is learning practice. Yeah, these are, these are as I understood, the quotes that you, uh, that you somehow... Uh... That are re really connected with this work because uh, this narrative that actually lasts from last 15 years. It's, uh, we tried in a way to condense and uh, to show it uh, through the slide projections and through these stories that Yelena actually connected and documentation that is also connected with the, with the mural itself. Mm. <clears throat> so we will have uh, slides to also cover the debate on a uh, uh, on the screens, on the screens we have, uh, and we are talking about uh, we are talking about the uh, event uh, which is called the Week of Latin America, or uh, which is called the Event of Solidarity of uh, the people of uh, Yugoslavia with the people of uh, Latin America. <coughs> uh, I, I'm sorry, I managed to quote some uh, flu as well. Uh, so. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the term which interconnects uh, Darinka's and uh, mind research um, is uh, also the term uh, which I would call solidarity in time. Uh, and through this term, uh, what we want to say is uh, that we don't want to naturalize the facts of research or discovery or, or uh, digging from history, but we also want to uh, observe our own position, what we are doing here, what is behind our research affinities. I mean, to be uh, contemporary uh, means to live with time and in time. So to live with one's present, but it also assumes certain solidarity in time. 
and uh, sharing the particular moments of time in which uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, of time with both past and uh, future. And uh, uh, what uh, what uh, what we are uh, um, doing with uh, with uh, with this uh, big event, huge event that's uh, obviously uh, in the shadow of. Uh, uh, historical uh, memory and in the shadow of current political memory and this is uh, the this is one big event uh, uh, where a lot of people from different uh, Latin American countries uh, who were most of them uh, were already in political exile in Europe gathered uh, gathered in Belgrade and gathered uh, okay in non-aligned Yugoslavia but not uh, uh, in a gathering that uh, that was supported by the official structures of non-alignment, but in a gathering that was initiated uh, by the Student Cultural Center, uh, people from Student Cultural Center, Tribune program, so the discussion political program. And uh, this event brought uh, actually uh, a lot of artists, intellectuals, uh, and um, filmmakers, a lot of uh, like really uh, political activists who were involved uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, different guerrilla struggles in uh, uh, Latin America in the 70s and who were either in exiles or, or, uh, or coming directly. So this was like really large political event, which resulted with a, um, with a tribune music program, film program, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, paintings uh, nowadays paled on the uh, altar wall of Student Cultural Center, uh, of Student Cultural Center. Uh, and, um, uh, Okay, now we now we see uh, on this on original. this slide, yes, original uh, uh, original painting uh, painted by uh, Brigadas uh, Salvador Allende. Uh, but in the meantime, the image paled. The image the image paled fully. We, uh, we we just need to return. And I uh, uh, I want it because uh, I'm not sure how much uh, how much time um, how much time we will have for. Um, in one in one moment, I would I wanted to uh, share on you on chat just to uh, be aware who was present, like some examples of people who were present in this uh, in this uh, in this event. So uh, okay, uh, what I'm uh, what I'm uh, uh, and what we are doing with uh, with this uh, with this reconstruction also problematizing our own position and also problematizing what does it mean to somehow interconnect with the past to be solidary with the past event. What does it mean? Today, uh, uh, we are using, uh, uh, I think, uh, reconstructing this one event. So thinking about it from the multiple perspectives, we are, uh, we are using a certain technique of uh, zooming in, of uh, showing the uh, close-up uh, uh, picture, which uh, shows many complexities and contradictions. Uh, and this materiality also shows that uh, uh, the entire sentimentality of conclusions we are coming from the nominal, from this aerial perspective of uh, observation that we discussed about yesterday, uh, is one perspective that we can have uh, on these events. But it, this perspective is also perhaps uh, the uh, product of a certain uh, need for uh, maybe political uh, idealization which uh, of uh, certain phenomena, definitely progressive phenomena uh, and so on. But uh, 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 this zoom in, this close up uh, uh, method, uh, uh, which we are calling uh, also solidarity in time, solidarity in time also through the way uh, we are building the, 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 the story, we are reconstructing the, the story and building something of it. Uh, is uh, uh, is uh, full of uh, this uh, this uh, different uh, different contradictions and the questions: what is progressive, what is reactionary, what is right, what is wrong, what is right politics, what's wrong politics, and what we can use today. So when I was uh, uh, attempting to write uh, the first uh, edition of the uh, of the article or, or a textual uh, field which corresponds with uh, uh, Darinka's research. I faced uh, also this uh, in, in, impossibility to uh, put it in uh, like one line of uh, uh, the story. <clears throat> 
and uh, because uh, there were uh, so many, uh, so many, uh, so many voices or so many actors. When I say actor, I mean uh, like the actor of non-aligned movement, the actor uh, of the political relations between uh, Yugoslavia and the uh, countries of Latin America, the actor student cultural center as an alternative institution, the actor, the tribune of uh, student cultural center and its uh, um, moderator, curator, editor, Milo Petrovic, the actor, uh, the group of artists, uh, representatives uh, of new artists uh, practices, um, so more or less uh, conceptual art, performance art and expanded me media who were uh, cohabiting in the student cultural center. And then the actor, the field of official and alternative uh, uh, politics and the actor uh, Darinka Popmitic and the actor Darinka Popmitic and myself uh, standing in front of this uh, uh, empty ball and the actor of, of course, uh, the brigadis, uh, the, the muralists and the, the, the singers, the artists and so on. So uh, then, uh, then I came um, across in the research that uh, one of the participants of this Tribune program of this event of Solidarity was a Belgian sociologist and uh, filmmaker, Andre Armand uh, yeah. Matelar, uh, who uh, made uh, uh, one film called uh, La Spirale. So uh, he's uh, uh, basically <clears throat> using a spiral montage of uh, uh, facts which Okay, in his films uh, are uh, showing, uh, demonstrating that since the very moment Allende came to power, uh, the United States had planned to uh, crush his attempts uh, to establish uh, uh, socialism uh, in, uh, in Chile. And this film was actually first promoted during these events um, <clears throat> in uh, uh, the week of Latin America in uh, in uh, in Belgrade, and uh, then uh, then for me uh, then for me it looked uh, very interesting uh, his uh, way of making the spiral, uh, and maybe our way of making a story as a spiral by meeting different actors, the actors that I uh, that I just uh, uh, named, uh, participating in. So this is like a construction made of certain uh, fragments. So it's rather an editorial, uh, an editorial process uh, in a way. So the Solidarity in Time, which interconnects, uh, <clears throat> which interconnects Darinka Popmitic and my research uh, with the political and artistic struggle of Salvador Allende Moralist Brigades, uh, is also something that uh, uh, in a way oh, brings to the center the term politics of historicization, something that I dealt with uh, a lot with my, uh, uh, in, my previous, uh, in my previous research. Uh, the politics of historicization, meaning that uh, uh, we uh, have to assume existence of a certain struggle, of a struggle in time uh, and with time, uh, but also struggle for political voice that deserves to be heard in the future and therefore needs to be included in the past. We are talking about to be remembered historically. A solidarity uh, in time requests the historical approach to, uh, uh, to uh, contemporaneity in which both past and, pre past and present uh, and the future uh, are becoming sites of uh, struggle. And uh, this historical moment of solidarity of Yugoslav people, people of, of Latin America um, uh, has uh, the status of, um, uh, in a way, lost object. This is an object of uh, common and shared solidarity that no longer exists. So I'm using uh, this uh, idea of lost objects uh, borrowed from Hitterstein's analysis uh, in her text, Archive of Lost Objects, where she, she asked, what do we do with this rumble, with this, uh, with this uh, 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 in a way, rubbish of, uh, of, of the past, how we construct uh, political solidarity which, uh, which has meaning today. Uh, so not only the, as you see on these slides, uh, uh, the material evidence of this precarious moment scars and spread around the scattered archives, but also the solidarity itself has slowly paled and disappeared both as uh, idea and action as a uh, project and affect. So Darinka and myself are posing the question, is it possible to express solidarity in time beyond mere commemoration? 
The project of solidarity uh, of Yugoslav people with the people of Latin America was part of the Tribune program of Student Cultural Center Belgrade. Okay, one actor is on stage. We are meeting one actor in uh, the spiral story and the formation of Student Cultural Center, which is important also to know in this entire economy of non-aligned movement and what a non-aligned movement contributed to speaking about uh, different art, uh, cultural practices and so on and whatnot. Uh, so this was an alternative institution and uh, not part of the official structures of non-aligned movement uh, and socialist Yugoslavia. The formation of Student Cultural Center was the result of political activities of uh, the group of young intellectuals who led the protest and student union and control over the, over the building of the state security service, which was undergoing uh, reconstruction, was given to the student union at the very end of 60s, and the student protests in 68, uh, very prominent uh, with its political voice um, of the critique of socialism with socialism, as they would say, ended uh, with the symbolic and simulative uh, co uh, statement uh, of uh, Comrade Tito, who said students are right. In the words of the editor of uh, Tribune, and now we are uh, <clears throat> bringing in Milo Petrovic, uh, this is his name, uh, the Tribune offered uh, a site of reminded public speech, intellectual debate and social activism. And between mid 70s and mid 80s, the Tribune presented several conferences and events. One was the week of Spain in 76, coinciding with the end of Franco's dictatorship. One was uh, another was the week of Latin America in 77, uh, which was engaging with anti-colonial struggle of various militant guerrilla movements in the circumstances of corporate neo colonialism. Also, the first women's question outside of the Western context was uh, um, posed during the conference Druxas Jena, Comrades Women in 78, and an event dedicated to militant revolutionary Chilean cinema in the second week of Latin America was organized in the 80s. Uh, then uh, after the 80s, we have uh, uh, new movements in anti-psychiatry discussed in uh, 83 and then uh, 84, the critique of Yugoslav internal uh, politics that slowly led to the dissolution of federation. The Student Cultural Center, to return to my first actor, uh, in a spirit of spiral, Telling uh, operating uh, was operating uh, at the time as an alternative institution that opened up uh, its space to experimental art and exhibition practices, to social activism, and to critical intellectual development. It was self-produced as uh, I use this term uh, as institution in movement, so it's institution dash in, in dash movement or institution dash movement. So between the institution, what we understand as institution, and the movement growing out, because it grew out of the student and workers protests in 68, and continuing that movement from the inside as a critical wave supported by intellectual, uh, intellectual and, in and international flux of artists, intellectuals and activists. Many people participated in student cultural centers activities without being part of its formal institutional structure, but worked instead in the same space, often influencing the regular program. Student cultural center was the place where people actually lived. Young artists and intellectuals spent time in proximity with self-conducted teaching learning environments and the term alternative university that many of the former editors of Student Cultural Center frequently use precisely speaks about that. Uh, now, uh, this very moment of solidarity and what is its context. So the context may be like social context can be uh, uh, another actor. The event of solidarity of Yugoslav people with the people of Latin America was one of the crests uh, of the wave of world sol solidarity with Chile after the fall of the government of Salvador Allende and beginning of uh, Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship. Uh, the decade of the 70s uh, was the era, as we know, of the worst military di dictatorships in Latin American countries, the time of the fall of the first democratically elected uh, uh, Marxist uh, president in Latin America, Allende, in which the generals of Argentina were waging the famous uh, Guerra Sucia, dirty war against its population exterminating political uh, enemies uh, by committing such an act as throwing people out of airplanes into the ocean. And of course, we can also speak about this ocean uh, as uh, the, 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 the place uh, of uh, solidarity as well. 
Uh, the, so this was the time when many um, political refugees fled uh, to Europe and along with assistance of the, uh, in the wider sense of social care and security within certain circles also uh, received solidary help uh, in promoting and agitating for their political goals. I'm returning to Petrovic. Petrovic uh, was uh, since uh, his early youth interested in anti-colonial revolutions as young, uh, a uh, high school student in a small Bosnian city of Bielina. He read books about Algeria's National Liberation Front and among them uh, La Question, uh, which, is, which is written by famous journalist uh, Henri Allège, describing the methods of torture used by French paratroopers and revolutionaries. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so French para paratroopers on revolutionaries. And uh, the book made, uh, as I learned from uh, witne witnessing of Petrovic, uh, significant impression of, on him and then influenced his later political and intellect intellectual interest. We can also return to previous mm -hmm. slides. So. Uh, then after the shameful killing of the Cong Congolese independence uh, leader, Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected prime minister of Democratic Republic of Congo, Petrovic's uh, school organized a program of solidarity with Congo and people we see here, uh, this conference is- um, Woman comrade, yes. Uh, comrade woman, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the first, uh, the first. Uh, uh, so uh, after, uh, after, after this, uh, uh, after the event with Patrice uh, Lumum, with uh, uh, with sorry, uh, yeah, well, after after killing of uh, Patrice Lumumba. Sorry, I'm mean, not on too many ch channels. <laughs> Uh, the school, the secondary school in uh, Bielina has organized a program of solidarity with Congo and big demonstrations in the streets. So uh, we see that individual political consciousness and social engagement were part of the larger cognitive political infrastructure that Yugoslav socialism and non-alignment provided. And that was uh, conveyed into fields of political education and practice throughout the country, not only in the metropolitan centers and capitals of various Yugoslav republics. And now we see different uh, um, student protests, student cultural center, the way that people lived in student cultural center and this generation of conceptual uh, artists, uh, uh, critics and intellectuals who were active in student cultural center and who obviously, which we will learn during our spiral didn't, uh, establish much of connections uh, uh, like uh, in a sense of establishing solidarity in the present moment. Uh, so we had to, uh, we had to uh, switch to another form of solidarity, which we also call solidarity in time. Uh, so uh, the next actor uh, would be uh, Edward Cardell and his historical roots of non-alignment, uh, which is very, uh, uh, again, characteristic for the Yugoslav understanding of uh, non-alignment. Two years before the week of Latin America took place in Student Cultural Center, the book Historical Roots of uh, uh, non-alignment uh, uh, by Edward Cardell. Uh, so it was published in uh, uh, 75. Uh, and Edward Cardell, uh, who we mentioned uh, yesterday as well, was famous prominent Yugoslav politician, revolutionary and uh, theorist. And for him, uh, non-alignment uh, was not uh, a completed project, but a long lasting political process in which all independent countries will overcome the residual effects of colonial epoch and progress towards developed socialist societies. Uh, interestingly, where Cardell speak about developed socialist societies, he does not mean a uh, developed system or, uh, but, uh, a certain, uh, even if you will, abundance of, of, of everything in life, so some kind of a good life. Non-alignment in its linguistical uh, political substance assumed rejection of any alliance with either of the political blocs that maintained the Cold War. And uh, an important uh, aspect of such positioning is summarized precisely in Cardell's thesis in his uh, historical roots uh, of non-alignment, according to which this uh, bi-directional negation of the power blocks does not imply reaching the ideal point of uh, the point of uh, ideal equidistance from the existing centers of power, but what it assumes is actively countering the uh, power politics 
as such. So this, this was a, a very important uh, uh, paragraph uh, for me to read it in the book. Although official politics of non-alignment was central to the event of solidarity of the people of Yugoslavia with the people of Latin America, it was precisely that socialist context and alternative critical institutionalism developed with such context uh, that enabled uh, this large gathering during the weeks of Latin America. It was also important to notice that the non-aligned movement in the mid seventies was slowly consolidating in the international hegemonic commons. I'm. Uh, uh, putting this in a quote mark, uh, uh, so hegemonic commons embedded in the institution of UN, United Nations. Although Tito was one of the first uh, international politicians to support Allende's government, Yugoslav uh, non-alignment was shifting towards pragmatic solutions in this moment, in this moment where the event uh, of solidarity took place in Student Cultural Center. So revolutionary critique uh, of all existent was often shadowed by defense of what's being achieved. And this was the politics of Yugoslavia, the politics of non-aligned Yugoslavia within that moment. Petrovic remembers uh, how uh, this different, uh, how this um, uh, Yugoslav uh, official standpoint at the time uh, was uh, uh, differed from uh, what the young guerrillas in Latin American countries were striving for. Uh, unlike the official political trajectories, the Student Cultural Center Tribune program regularly co collaborated with the liberation movements from Latin America, Vietnam, and many other places. And the meeting on, uh, in Belgrade within uh, the extraterritorial space of Yugoslavia, in the moment extraterritorial, was one of the most import important political uh, events for Latin American intelligentsia in uh, exile. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not what I'm saying, but what uh, these people who had opportunity to meet from everywhere, from Chile, from Argentina, from uh, Peru, from Uruguay, uh, connected with these various uh, uh, with, this, uh, with these various movements. And maybe uh, you can help us that I uh, uh, now send uh, this information from the text. And uh, then he was, um, uh, Milo Petrovic, uh, Milo Petrovic, uh, uh, just, uh, just, just one second, uh, I will copy it. Uh, <clears throat> ah, this is the group. Okay, we can, uh, no, 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 sorry, 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 all right. So this, and we can send it in, in the chat. So you can see, uh, you can, uh, you can see in a, in a chat, uh, I mean, uh, all these, uh, uh, all these participants and I mean, just to understand what kind of uh, the, uh, the event was that. And uh, Milo Petrovic was witnessing. I remember the opening of the event, more than 500 people uh, in the auditorium. When the singer and author uh, Shango uh, Sehas was about to start singing the song Asta Siempre, uh, he said that he would like to mm. sing it without a microphone mm. and invited Roberto, the brother of Che Guevara and mm. other participants mm. and the audience to join. The excitement of the people uh, throughout the big hall of Student Cultural Center was almost palpable. Uh, Brigada Salvador Allende uh, painted three large uh, scale murals in the streets of Belgrade uh, with solidary support of students of Belgrade Faculty for Political Science and Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, we can trace the activities of Brigadis through the archival te television footage, which is recorded on pa painted uh, locations. Uh, one question to organizers. Do I have uh, five minutes from now or what do you think? Well, actually, you have two minutes, but five minutes would be fine. But then we would we would need to wrap up. And All right. So, uh, yeah. So there is this uh, there is this mural, which is central for our story. And we can uh, we can debate mm -hmm. about it. Uh, it uh, it. Uh, uh, it is uh, the 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 muralists uh, are appearing in the first name, so like they have their guerrilla names, and then do, they don't have uh, they don't have their um, <clears throat> their real full artistic uh, artistic names. 
Uh, but what is important uh, in this presentation uh, to, uh, to show these contradictions, uh, frictions, uh, internal contradictions in in friction and frictions uh, is to uh, bring to the stage uh, the actor of Darinka and, uh, and uh, the group of conceptual artists. Uh, as generally is the case with the street art, its existence is temporary and uh, is often connected to a specific moment and particular situa situation. None of the Brigadis murals, uh, murals uh, were preserved over time. They paled and vanished in parallel with fading of the official ideology of socialism, non-alignment and revolutionary uh, struggle and its replacement by the currently prevailing blend of a new neoliberal capitalist ideology. Uh, economy and uh, uh, far-right ideology. And the story uh, of Brigada Salvador Allende was remembered uh, in 2005 uh, with the project on solidarity initiated by artist Arinka Pogmitic. For it, she refreshed the colors on the remnants of mural on the wall of Student Cultural Center, expressing by this act her solidarity in time with the events of people's struggle for decolonization and liberation. And what is interesting in a deeper examination of solidarity and what offers more complex picture of it is the fact uh, that uh, Student Cultural Center at the time um, developed rich artistic programs that communities who worked together to develop new, uh, the language of new art uh, exhibited in the gallery, uh, that none of them, uh, none of the usual Student Cultural Center artists joined the execution of the murals, the execution of these murals of solidarity. In other words, the solidarity had not been uh, achieved in the present tense, but through the labor of history, not through the immediate action, but through mediation. And this shows that solidarity uh, in time does not have to be immediate or even immediately recognizable, but also might take times, can be durational, it can reach other uh, unexpected uh, addresses, who can re-identify uh, and uh, newly ally with the uh, with, uh, with the historical uh, with the historical contemporary, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is the idea. And of course, if we uh, return to <clears throat> the terrain of uh, language of art, what we also spoke about uh, yesterday, what is progressive, what is reac reactionary, and and uh, what are the contradictions that uh, between the progressive languages of art and progressive politics. And this was quite often the case on Yugoslav terrain. We have many, many, many examples, uh, examples of that. Uh, uh, there is this moment where uh, for student cultural uh, center artists, uh, for this group of conceptual artists, uh, these uh, murals uh, were explicit political uh, activism and traditional pictorial expression. So traditional pictorial and traditional pictorial expression was uh, artistically speaking signifier of uh, uh, not pro maybe progressive enough uh, politics, although of course, like politically they were all uh, solidary with uh, guerrilla struggles in, uh, in Latin American, in Latin American countries. And uh, did we did we manage to 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 send the information? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is uh, this this is it. I don't know why we couldn't uh, we couldn't send uh, we couldn't uh, send this text. Too much it's... characters. I think that maybe we should uh, just split attach, it uh, yeah, split it or into... attach uh, the, um, the, the, the the. Maybe you can attach a PD, uh, PDF and as a file send it as well. Yes, it would be best. Okay. Uh, yeah, we will. We will see. So, who's uh, who's uh, who's interest interested? Uh, you can write me, and I can share with you. Uh, I can share with you the uh, the text. Uh, this text that I was uh, talking about, which which is part of uh, the book "Past This Quiet" by uh, edited by Rasha Salti and Christina Kuri. Thank you. Thank you, Yellen and Darinka, very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for being on time as well. Uh, I would like to open the floor for the question. See if anyone has a question. If not, in the meantime, I would like to I would like to ask a question. Well, I was very much interested in what you said about the lack of solidarity of artistic solidarity in present time. Uh, 
And I was wondering, did you maybe um, in your research come across uh, other instances of solidarity, in particular with Chile, or other initiatives that were maybe coming from artistic community or, or beyond the artistic community? I mean, given the year of the week of Latin America, which is 77, the reaction of Yugoslavia to the events in Chile seems somewhat delayed. I mean, if we consider, for example, Italy and the events with Venice Biennale in 1974, that was, and the series of events that were titled uh, Libertal Chile, and other initiatives coming from Italy and from France as well, and some in Poland. I was wondering, did you maybe, may, maybe find other examples prior to, to the week of Latin America in 77 in, uh, in Belgrade? You mean in a Yugoslav context or? Yes, 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 in, in Yugoslav context, yes. And maybe as well, I mean, that would be kind of a second question, but related to, to this one, um, did you maybe as well look at, at the participation of, or non-participation of Yugoslav artists related to the initiatives of Museum of Solidarity that we uh, heard from Elodie about, and its second stage, Museum of Resistance as well. I mean, what was the relationship of Yugoslavia, if you, if you came across any, anything uh, there? Did, did Karinka, you did you come say? across? Uh, uh, actually, this, um, this week of Latin America, uh, as, uh, as can be found in a, a report in Students Cultural Center, uh, uh, it was a project that actually traveled uh, uh, through the uh, Yugoslav republics. So uh, I think that there were uh, organized exhibitions, but I cannot, now I, I don't remember uh, the 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 places, but uh, it actually was travel uh, traveling exhibition, uh, and um, uh, it, it would uh, it it is also interesting <coughs> that uh, the material that I found for the mural actually developed from the later on developed from the initiative from um, mm. state television because when they found out that I did the I tried to reconstruct the part of the mural, uh, they actually uh, called me and they. Uh, went through the archive of uh, state television and act they actually found a lot of materials. So the week of Latin America was very well covered uh, in um, state television uh, with a lot of uh, TV shows. Uh, actually, there were uh, a TV show about week of Latin America in uh, Students Cultural Center. Uh, after that, there was a, a TV show called for Chile. Um, it was debate uh, in, um, it was a studio debate in about the, the, uh, the situation, the political situation in Chile. And um, it was also, uh, the background was one of the murals that was presented in the Students Cultural Center. And uh, the third uh, TV show that they, they the, the one Andrich actually found uh, was, um, uh, was uh, 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 Pablo Neruda's funeral. So it, this was also, so uh, from this very uh, short in, uh, view of, you know, like reflection of this week of Latin America, I can tell you that uh, this, um, this uh, uh, event had a, a big uh, uh, reflection in, in the society. Also the third mural that I actually didn't found out the, any photograph and any part of documentation was uh, uh, produced uh, in the, um, I think the la latest information that I found that it was uh, in the technical fac on the, the fac technical faculty in Belgrade, and um, but the, there was no a any documentation either in the, in a Tanyugi state uh, uh, agency or uh, in a, in a state TV. They mm -hmm. didn't record it. So actually, it was interesting what the earlier <laughs> said that this lack of documentation. Um, is very significant because uh, also the, the Yugoslav state didn't think about archiving itself. And so when you go, start going through the archives, you came, you know, like a spot of information. And when you start, start the project and start gathering information, then people ca come and they, you know, they found, they, they bring their own material, their own investigation. So this is the solidarity that, I, that we meant uh, about, you know, this is like, uh, and this is also connected very well with the Armand Batelar, this spiral, because the, the events are connected, because the, maybe uh, this moment is much more connected to the 1977 than maybe uh, the mural that I did in 2005. That was the point. Mm 
Mm. But okay, I, I understood that Tihana, Tihana asked if he if he know uh, if he know events. Okay, this is seventy five. Uh, the events in uh, Chile are uh, seventy three, uh, and uh, uh, in some in some other countries uh, of Latin America, maybe even before around the time. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean. Uh, uh, I understand. I understand what you mean, but uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not uh, familiar with uh, uh, if any uh, if any event was preceding to this one. Uh, of course, there were there were very concrete official, um, you know, like infrastructures events. Uh, I don't know, like in example, the the person. The person uh, I forgot what was uh, what was his name. The person of Croatian uh, uh, of Croatian. Uh, Descent was writing uh, economic program for the government of uh, Saudi Allende. Yeah, Vuskovic. Yeah, I was, but I was referring more or more maybe to the reactions within the artistic community and how the. And that, that the is interesting, you know. Yeah, yeah that because yeah. this mural is about that. You know, like you have this uh, week of Latin America. You have this uh, huge production of three mu uh, murals, and you have like this uh, political struggle, political debates, and you have contemporary are seen behind that wall that is somehow involved with politics but not interconnected with the situation yeah, that, uh, that is something that that I found you know very very curious yes uh, <laughs> in the meantime we we have a question uh, from Elodie as well uh, she raised the hand uh, uh, so Elodie if you would like to uh, uh, no. okay yeah okay <laughs> thank you Thank you, Tiana, uh, and thank you uh, uh, for the presentation. It was very interesting, and I uh, I learned a lot of things. And uh, I have uh, some question. I am sending a file, and uh, maybe uh, Miguel uh, would have some uh, reply um, uh, elements too, um, because the the spiral, uh, this film, this movie, uh, made me think about uh, the mural. Um, which was created in Habana in the 1967 during uh, the Salon of May, uh, which is a traditional salon in Paris, but which was uh, um, organized in Habana uh, in uh, 1967. And it was an initiative proposed by uh, Wilfredo Lam, uh, who drew uh, like a spiral and every artist, participant artist uh, um, painted uh, a block, uh, a case um, of the spiral. So I wanted uh, to know if you could uh, read some uh, uh, maybe um, uh, things uh, about the participation of uh, uh, people who uh, uh, directed this uh, this movie. Uh, if they went they they went to uh, La Habana in the, in this time or not? If you can read something about that, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, there is a huge inter in, uh, interview with Arman Martelar, uh, but it's on in on in, in Serbo Croatian language. So it's not in Serbo. I mean, it's in it's Spanish. Not, it's, it's in Spanish. It's in Spanish. Well, but actually, we can send it to you. Yeah, yeah it's in Spanish, it. but uh, it's I in Spanish, know. but uh, but I think it's dubbed in uh, it's dubbed in in Serbo Croatian. The right. the conversation with uh, with Andre Mat uh, with um, Arman Martelar. Uh, I always want to say Andre. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you for the image. I mean, uh, uh, the the image is uh, the, this image is um, it's for me uh, now. You know, like when I see it, I would say that for me this is the museum of uh, you know like uh, solidarity. It's already in itself. It's composed as a, as a museum of uh, solidarity where people uh, co-participate artistically to in a in a collective process. In a collective process, this collective that's uh, also somehow uh, conceptualized and is having uh, in a way contemporary form. So it's not. Uh, uh, just rooted in tradition, but wants to deal with this, uh, you know, like art engage with uh, with uh, with the uh, contemporary uh, artistic processes. I mean, thank you very much for this image. It would be, uh, it would be one of the points of uh, our <laughs> further, uh, perhaps, um, uh, unfolding of the uh, of the story. As uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think it's uh, in any way connected with the film Les Pirales, 
but uh, uh, the principle uh, the principle is there i mean this is one of uh, not so in a way unique uh, principles but is uh, stemming from uh, the tradition of uh, historical avant-garde and uh, and soviet cinema and now for us it was the question how to you know like make art historical story so i couldn't make it and i have to uh, grab into the field of uh, uh, film into the field of cinema, cinema narration, in order to uh, get in peace with the uh, with the with the story uh, with the story I made, and in order to find some references. Whenever we find some references, we feel safer. <laughs> uh, and uh, okay. just. So, okay. just yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. just wanted to reply, Tihana, uh, one thing. Uh, uh, there is no, uh, there is one event after uh, in, in Croatia, like a follow-up event uh, that is publishing of the entire issue of the journal Nashe Teme, which has this symbolic title, Our Topics, uh, with uh, uh, mostly uh, sociological political uh, uh, analysis of of neo-colonialism, neo-colonialist regimes in uh, Latin America. <clears throat> okay, wonderful, thank you. And uh, Sanya has uh, a question. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I have uh, just a more of a comment, uh, more of a um, short, uh, how to say, uh, yeah, uh, a thank you actually for uh, for uh, bringing uh, this, uh, different perspective to the this uh, historical um, perspectives that we are uh, exploring here and I think it is very relevant that you mentioned uh, situating uh, ourselves uh, in the in the moment of uh, as you said the shadow of political memory of what are we and how are these kind of uh, historical uh, experiences um, uh, presented and uh, uh, or uh, intended to be forgotten today. Um, and I think it is very relevant to um, open up the question of methodology that you actually opened uh, with uh, asking uh, who are the actors and who are the voice and which voices um, lack the story and the, and the, uh, and the notion of, uh, uh, of these, um, uh, as you said, lost objects or yeah, the question of the archive uh, that Darinka also mentioned. Uh, so I think it is very important uh, that throughout all of these uh, discussions, we are aware of the uh, fact that uh, these marginal histories uh, in a way that have been marginalized, that are not marginal by themselves, but they, that have been marginal, marginalized and that are marginalized, um, require uh, a special attention uh, to the question of method methodology and rethinking methodology uh, as such. And I think it is very valuable to, to kind of try to to combine artistic research uh, with uh, with uh, with scholarly uh, more more of traditional scholarly research, uh, as 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 this kind of combination can open up uh, uh, um, a more complex perspectives like this um, uh, uh, this uh, idea of a spiral and rethinking of spatio. Uh, spatio dynamic uh, co uh, uh, component uh, of the whole story is part of what we are doing in this project by looking at also at the, as a network uh, looking at non-aligned movement as a network of cultural exchange and trying to to show this bigger picture and to also question the notions of how time and space is represented uh, from the centers of power. So I think it is very, very interesting to have these uh, different uh, perspectives. And I think it is, uh, this uh, session was very, very nice uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, so in a way, yeah, uh, I'm closing up now, <laughs> but Tihana, you should. We, uh, yeah, we have another, okay. Yeah, actually I, I missed the question in chat. So if we have time just to pick up another question and then we'll go for a break. Uh, the question is, I'm interested in the concept of historical contemporary that you raise. I see it as being very different from the history of the present. Would you be able to say whether it's the work of art and solidarity that reveals this? Uh, yeah, that is, that is the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
uh okay the question the question is very very complex we don't have uh, time to go into details but uh, uh, uh for me it is very it is very important uh, it is very important to speak about contemporaneity historically i mean i insist on that as uh, art historical and kind of i don't know like intellectual and in my entire uh, engagement uh uh, any other any other approach to contemporaneity leads us to this like constant uh, explosion from within on, of this moment of a super now, which uh, somehow I think uh, emphasizes the processes of um, uh, ahistoricism, of historical revisionism, of alternative facts. That is of all you know, like that we have a problem with nowadays. So uh, uh, this is one of the reasons of why I uh, uh, find a certain advantages that I graduated from our history and that I am, you know, like in a position to think about history and to fight for uh, progressive moments of history and understanding of history. So in that, in that sense, uh, uh, yeah, present is historical as well, but, uh, 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 I insist on observing the notion of contemporary historically. Uh, and, uh, you know, like art historiographically speaking, I would say that, you know, like everything we debate under the notion of contemporary is, uh, 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 is uh, an epoch which starts with, uh, you know, like uh, end of 60s up to, up to today. Okay, this, this is a debatable claim, but in example. So I think it's very important, thank you for the question, uh, to emphasize historical uh, contemporary. Yes, uh, if this was a question. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. I, I, uh, we see that you raised the hand, but if you don't mind to, to keep the question for the final discussion, as we are already five minutes late and we promised a break, <laughs> so we could, uh, uh, we could uh, include the, the, your question into the final discussion. We can also, if we go to the break, we can also stay with uh, with Miguel and discuss. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, like just a suggestion, propo proposal, if you uh, you decide. Well, yeah, maybe we, it would be fine that we do it all together for the final discussion. We will have a bit of time, but now just to, trying to keep up with the schedule, we we have a ten minutes break and we meet again at at uh, six six o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mute. We stop video.
Okay, um, we are going to start uh, with the second session. Um, uh, thank you, Hala, for <laughs> telling us that you need to uh, need to leave uh, in within the schedule. And uh, yeah, we, we we are trying to keep uh, keep the time as uh, as was announced. Uh, so um, I hope uh, that um, the 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 people uh, that uh, the participants of the next session are uh, all here. I don't see. Um, I don't see Isabel. Uh, do you see? Maybe if you. Yeah, I uh, actually uh, messaged her right before, and uh, she. We were in communication uh, to the last minute, so I hope that she will appear. Uh, and I will just uh, start uh, with uh, announcing uh, the two lectures that uh, are in the session and the two presenters. Um, so uh, first, uh, we will hear. Uh, we have a great honor. Uh, 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 to hear um, a lecture by Hala Halim, uh, titled a Lotus Journal and Questions of Translation and Anthologization. Um, so um, Hala Halim uh, is Associate Professor of Compar Comparative Literature and Middle Eastern Studies at New York University. Her book, Alexandrian Cosmopolitan Cosmopol Cosmopolitanism, an archive, uh, received an honorable mention for the Harry Levin Prize sponsored by American Comparative Literature Association. Clamor of the Lake, Halim's translation of a novel by Mohammed El Bisati, won an Egyptian State Incentive Award. Uh, so Hala, uh, it's a great honor to have you here once again and uh, the, floor is, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sanya, for this beautiful uh, introduction. And I'm truly grateful to you and Tihana for uh, the invitation. Uh, this workshop has been most enriching and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I'm sure it will inform my work as I go forward. Um, I just want to, to mention, as Sanya was saying, that I, I will have to leave because of an academic duty at the very end of the official uh, time, uh, 1.45 p.m. Uh, now, having published on the journal Lotus for a long while, I'm returning to that archive specifically to elaborate some work on, for the moment, work on an anthology. So any questions and any criticisms even more will be more, more than welcome. Uh, let me see if you can uh, see my PowerPoint. Um, uh, one second. Uh, Let's hope this is it. Has it appeared on the screen? Yes, uh, we can see it. You can put it on the presentation mode if you want. Uh huh. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's it great. Better? Yes, it's great. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so um, it was a delicate balancing act, though suffused with the spirit of the age. The act was the publication of the Afro Asian and uh, poetry and anthology and the time was 1971. True, the anthology had a lineage that stretched back for well over a decade, namely tracing back to Bandung and the Afro-Asian movement that followed. And indeed, it was published by the Afro-Asian Writers Association in the period when its permanent bureau was located in Cairo. Nor was an anthology published by the Afro-Asian Writers Association unprecedented. A previous poetry anthology had been issued by the association in 1963, back at the time when its permanent bureau was based in Colombo, Ceylon, uh, which I shall touch on. What claims to comprehensiveness could the editors possibly make about two such vast continents? And what is at stake thematically and or aesthetically in that hyphen between the Afro and the Asian? If the Oxford English Dictionary reminds us in one of the subheadings of the entry on anthology that it is, I quote, a collection of epigrams or other short poems written by various authors chosen as being especially fine or appropriate, unquote, does it follow that this anthology to create something of a canon, an Afro-Asian golden treasury as it were? But not so fast. Maybe I should give some context. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So um, this is a bit of a chronology. Of course, there's a prehistory to that chronology that I'm also working on, a pre-Bandung history. Uh, we begin with uh, Bandung in 1955 uh, for, for our purposes here. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I would cite Bandung's final communique and specifically the cultural uh, cooperation subheading. Um, this steers clear of ethnocentrism and issues a call for an emancipatory humanism. And I'm quoting now from the cultural co cooperation portion. It was not for a, from any sense of exclusiveness or rivalry with, our, with other groups of nations and other civilizations and cultures that the conference viewed the development of cultural cooperation among Asian and African yeah. countries. Yeah. Uh, Yelena, please, you have to, okay. Mm -hmm. um, true to the age-old tradition of tolerance and universality, the conference believed that African and Asian cultural cooperation should be developed in the larger context of world cooperation, which would also help in the promotion of world peace and understanding. Whereas the cultural community uh, condemns uh, cultural cooperation portion of the communique condemns colonialism, which not only prevents cultural cooperation, but also suppresses the national cultures of the people. That was a quote. And it presses for the acquisition of knowledge of each other's country and mutual cultural exchange. It makes no explicit reference to translation and concludes that, I quote, at this stage, the best results in cultural cooperation would be achieved by pursuing bilateral arrangements and by each country taking action on its own whenever possible and feasible, wherever possible and feasible. It is a modest call at that point in 1955. It's, uh, it speaks, it seeks uh, bilateral cooperation as distinct from inter, continental or supranational cultural cooperation. And yet it had this unforeseen cultural blossoming in the Afro-Asian movement that grew out of it. So you then have the 1956 Asian Writers Conference in uh, New Delhi, which is uh, one of the strands that go into the formation of the Afro-Asian Writers Association which is the main institution I'm dealing with today. And the Asian Writers Conference was uh, very much presided over by Mulk Raja Anand. So uh, from there, you have the Afro-Asian, uh, you have the, um, the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization Conference in Cairo, Egypt. This was the first one and it was held basically at the very end of December 1957 into the beginning of 1958. And it had already, the idea had already been mooted at Bandung to hold a second uh, Bandung in Egypt. And um, it was uh, followed by the first Afro-Asian Writers' Conference in, uh, in Tashkent in 1958. And uh, for a while afterwards, until the mid-1960s, the Permanent Bureau of Afro-Asian Writers was based in Colombo. In 1961, we have this very important event that's been so key to all our uh, conversations, or most of them, in this workshop, which is the non-aligned, uh, the Conference of Non-Aligned Countries. And in 1962, you have the second Afro-Asian Writers Conference in Egypt, which was quite formative uh, and put the question of translation firmly on the table all the more. I thought that for our purposes, I'd fast forward to an image. Um, let me see. So this is from the Ahram. Uh, it's on the 13th of February, 1962. And it's uh, President Tito's visit to Egypt and he's being escorted by President Nasser to the Red Sea. And they are being shown by marine scientists uh, all the, uh, the wells uh, of uh, the... Uh, marine wealth and uh, various institutions in the canal zone. Uh, of course, uh, this was uh, around the very same time of the, um, of the second Afro-Asian Writers Conference. And at, uh, at that particular event, you had um, 
uh, observer delegations, and one of them was uh, a Yugoslav de de uh, delegation together with uh, a Turkish one and a Cuban one uh, present at that conference. So uh, in 1966, you have the uh, Tricontinental, which uh, very important conference, which we've heard about. And you also have on a much smaller scale, something else, which is a decision to uh, relocate the uh, AWA, which is the Afro-Asian Writers Association, that's the acronym, its permanent bureau to Cairo, because Colombo's performance had uh, been uh, questionable in the eyes of some key figures, apparently there was cronyism, there was neglect of solidarity work among writers, and there was the impact of the Sino-Soviet split. And uh, the leadership of the Colombo Bureau was seen as aligned with the Chinese line. Then in March, 1967, you have the third Afro-Asian Writers Conference at uh, Beirut. And uh, the uh, permanent bureau is officially relocated uh, um, to Cairo. The Beirut conference devises mechanisms to implement the long pending resolutions of previous conferences, including the publication of a comprehensive anthology of Afro-Asian poetry and short stories and the issuing of an Afro-Asian quarterly in three languages, Arabic, English, and French. Um, uh, this then becomes the journal that will eventually be called Lotus. Earlier on, it was called Afro-Asian Writings, and it was launched in 1968. Um, um, and, um, uh, okay, uh, it's, um, I'd better show you some images. Um, I forgot to mention that there had been the 1963 uh, anthology that was published by the Colombo Bureau, and I'll return to it. Uh, some images uh, of a lotus. I'm not sure why. Oh, here we are. Uh, well, it's fast forwarding. Um, okay technical issues for a minute. So that was the first, this is an, an, an African, uh, an Arabic cover with the, uh, with the after, in, including post renaming with the uh, uh, iconic Lotus. Uh, there is a, the, a French one. Uh, this is the first, very first issue when it was called uh, Afro-Asian uh, writings. Okay, so, um, then um, it was actually a, a, a pretty useful thing that although the anthology and the uh, journal were supposed to coincide, when the journal, when the anthology was issued, it was several years uh, after the publication of Lotus. And so the journal provided um, a very important uh, uh, resource for the anthology, which drew much of its material from it. Uh, the uh, the Afro-Asian Poetry Anthology was published in 1971, as I mentioned, from uh, the late 1970s and under the, um, the shadow of uh, the uh, peace treaty with Israel, the permanent bureau moved to Beirut and, and, Be and Lotus was published there and was edited by the Pakistani poet Faiz, Ahmed Faiz. And then after the, um, the Israeli invasion of uh, Beirut in 1982, it, it, uh, it relocated to Tunis and then eventually was discontinued. From the 1990s into the 2000s, uh, you have eventually the offices of our moving back to Cairo and repeated attempts to revive the journal, which is finally revived in 2016. And the association itself is named the Writers' Union of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So um, my argument is that Lotus represents a decidedly anti-Eurocentric project of comparatism that, uh, was that also compels our attention by virtue of being a supranational internationalist one in contradistinction to 
forms of comparative literature that produced in the West that are nation-based. And it's amazing when you read the ta table of contents uh, uh, of the, uh, issues published in the late 1960s, early 70s, where you encounter names that have become so benchmark that one cannot uh, afford to overlook in any survey course of, say, uh, revamped world literature, uh, or a post-colonial literature course. Um, I'd mentioned briefly uh, Dennis Brutus, Alex Laguma, Gabriel Okara, Raj Anand, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, of course, uh, the Iraqi Abdel Wahab al Bayeti, Ghassan Kenathani and Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinians, the Syrian Adonis, Ngugi uh, Wathiongu, the Kenyan um, Egyptians, Amal Dunul, Salah Shaheen, and Yahya Ha'i, among others. Um, Okay, um, now Leah Price has spoken of the tokenism embodied in the anthology form, and I quote her, it is a synecdochal aesthetic that corresponds to an equally atomistic model of individual upward mobility. She is admittedly addressing the anthology genre in a Western tradition. So what then of the anthology compiled in the framework of the liberation period. I maintain that the 1971 Afro-Asian poetry anthology skillfully executed a delicate balancing act between seeking uh, to proffer at least one text, often more from a given country on the two continents, while deliberately sidestepping synecdochal claims. As to why it did so, to my mind, it was a provisional third world aesthetic that corresponded not to Price's atomistic model of individual upward mobility, but rather to an imaginative geography subtended by so solidarity and open onto internationalism, as I shall show. The anthology performed that act by virtue of positioning in paratextual material, not least the editor's acknowledgments, and his preface, as well as the bios of the uh, contributing poets themselves. The preface goes beyond the customary disclaimer about representativeness. Uh, instead, it grapples concertedly, concertedly with the issues raised by such an anthology and crafts insightful postulates uh, uh, on the volumes, politics, and poetics. So my discussion of the paratexts of the anthology does not aim solely at explicating the politics and poetics underpinning the compilation per se. So I'm not merely mining the statements uh, made there. Rather, and this is part of a broader ongoing project of mine, it's part of a determined effort to trace the labor of editors and translators and a variety of others really, working within the Afro-Asian movement. Uh, yesterday, we had this question that was posed, uh, how do you access material? What forms of material, uh, print material, archival material? Just how much does that tell you? How far does it take you? Um, and um, I've been advocating for some time now that uh, we attend to the unregistered minutia of the Afro-Asian, the marginalia of actors such as letters, gray literatures, accounts of debates in corridors, the accounts that survive in memoirs, that survive in memories, that survive in very ephemeral coverage here and there, uh, also uh, very little read spin-off texts relating to the period, whether they were published at the same time or much later, um, and the, my sense is that this will give us uh, an insight into the agency of the actual actors and producers within uh, the uh, Afro-Asian movement and their contribution. Um, and um, in addition to memoirs, uh, uh, providing a non-top-down approach to uh, the, that corpus and that archive, I would suggest to the looking at the world of translators and interpreters who are 
absolutely essential to making the uh, machinery itself of uh, the conferences, of the publications uh, work and who shoulder a very um, a considerable linguistic burden and are often called upon in non-registered fashions to intervene in a sort of a diplomatic manner. So they have their invisible and highly valuable roles in these contexts. And uh, they also, and this is something to be delved into in a, in a larger project, they also coin terms for forms of um, discourse that may have been quite new at that point in time. So there is the effortless, or probably quite, as I've been told, quite massively stressful, uh, not effortless, I modify that, massively stressful uh, undertaking of being in, a, in an interpretation booth and suddenly being confronted by a term un, unheard of before and other booths being dependent on your pivotal uh, production and therefore on the spot and on the spur of the moment coining a translation for it. So um, uh, the Afro-Asian anthology, uh, and I'd better show you an image of it. The, this is the uh, trilingual, these are the trilingual covers. Uh, there's um, an ad for it from Lotus, <laughs> and uh, it was a, a first anthology. It was followed by a short story anthology also. So at any rate, the Afro-Asian anthology was co-edited by Edward al kharrat and Nihad Salem. And I'll give brief biographies uh, of both because they afford us some sort of sense of the trajectories of actors in the Afro-Asian movement. And the biographies also demonstrate their agency in their positions, ideological positions, their multiple skills, and the fluidity of their multitasking between editing, translation, interpretation, reviewing, writing, etc. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So Edward al Kharat was born in Alexandria in 1927 uh, uh, into an increasingly impoverished family to a mother from the Delta and a father from Upper Egypt who had been a trader. He later joins the Faculty of Law of Alexandria University. In the 1940s, while supporting his family after his father's death, he undertakes various jobs and becomes a member of an underground Trotskyist group, also in Alexandria. Um, and this eventually costs him two years in detention from 1948 to 1950. Eventually, uh, he moves to Cairo in the late 1950s and starts working at the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization and also the Afro-Asian Writers Association. And he comes to serve as the editor of the journal Lotus. And um, uh, he, uh, became, after the publication of his first book, which had been really roughly at the same time as his move to Cairo, and this is Hitan Alia, a collection uh, of short stories in 1959, there would be a long dry spell where he would publish no books of creative writing per se. During that period, his endeavors uh, were mainly confined to translation, articles in Lotus and elsewhere, short critiques, um, uh, contributions to the cultural program uh, of the radio. And then from 1972 onwards, he would publish prolifically in a whole variety of genres, uh, for example, novels, short stories, uh, essays, uh, poems, literary criticism. He has an important, uh, important corpus of, of attempts to theorize um, modern Arabic literature. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And he resigns from APSO and AWA, both institutions, in 1983 to devote himself to writing. He then rises to prominence uh, and is translated into several languages and receives more and more awards. 
um, Nihat Salem's biography is in terms of her uh, social background rather different, but there are ideological overlaps. So she comes from an elite background. She's upper crust, a part Turco-Circassian on her mother's side. And her father, uh, was Ahmed Salem, is credited of be with being one of the first aviators. And there's a sense of the avant-garde in her background. And she then becomes a leftist. And uh, two very interesting uh, moments or experiences in her biography that I had the pleasure of hearing about directly from her when I was interviewing her were during the Suez War when she joined um, the resistance in the canal uh, zone and uh, there were a lot of leftists to there and a lot of women participants so that her whole account of her role during the Suez War and uh, the other uh, interesting moment is um, arriving in Algeria right after decolonization and teaching Arabic in a one class school. Uh, and of course, that has the arrival in Algeria has its own prehistory, given that there were very strong connections, both on an official governmental level and on the level of leftists, uh, leftist militants between um, Egypt and Algeria during the Algerian War of Independence. So <clears throat> she then uh, studies um, uh, English literature at the American University in Cairo and later joins the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization and also worked as a translator in the Afro-Asian Writers Association. And she becomes one of arguably the most exceptional translators that they have on board. Later on, she moves to a variety of jobs, including the Organization of African Unity, the PLO, and she is at the UN when Arabic is instated in the mid 1970s and works at the UN and at UNESCO, where uh, she is, uh, where, where it is a period where UNESCO uh, had a third worldist orientation with Ahmad, Amadou Mukhtar Mbo and so on. <clears throat> and she works with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now her formation, that solid grounding in European languages and literatures gradually followed by increasing competence in, in literary Arabic, partly or primarily acquired within the Afro-Asian context, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, that formation is <clears throat> very similar to what I have seen with several other translator interpreter colleagues of hers who I've interviewed. And I should say that a lot of them uh, moved smoothly and seamlessly between written translation and interpretation, whether simultaneous or consecutive. And uh, like her, they were thrust into interpretation very often. It was thrust upon them. It wasn't a job that they uh, sort of uh, embraced or welcomed, but very often, uh, and this is an anecdote that I heard from others, it was similar to what they had Selim herself experienced. And she told me that it, it was the case that the interpreter at some event failed to show up. So Edward Kharat shoved her into the interpretation situation although it was merely consecutive and that launched her. And there are other uh, translators who said that this was precisely what happened. So it was sink or swim, learn on the job. And similarly, as, a, as with Nihad Salem, uh, many of them who came from English departments and French departments had received a classical European training in the canons of these literatures. This was not in the least the season of comparative literature at universities like Cairo and Alexandria, not at all. So working in the Afro-Asian movement gave them a, a very different formation. It introduced them to a completely different literary corpus simultaneously with their travel as interpreters to a whole variety of African and Asian countries. So uh, Al-Kharat was uh, the, the supervisor of uh, the secretariat that ran the whole uh, uh, translator-interpreter apparatus. 
and it, it had a core of um, appointees, roughly five, and the rest were freelancers, and um, many of them, as I mentioned, were women, which is a very fascinating aspect because you have an official um, discourse within particularly the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization, the mother institution, if you wish, on women's rights. So it's very nice to put in parallel the, uh, the practices of these women, the approach to them in their professional context in relation to that discourse. And it seems to me uh, that to a large degree, they were quite empowered. Um, and I should add that not all of these uh, translators, interpreters had a leftist or came from a leftist background. Quite the contrary, you had some people from the ancien regime, the monarchical regime, uh, who were not at all keen on socialism. You had people who uh, were solidly middle class, but really, um, unable to take on the kind of uh, texts that they were being exposed to due on account of the, uh, the formation that they had received in, say, the English department. So delving into the history of these translators has kind of pluralized the backgrounds. For example, uh, there is um, a fascinating uh, comment, a rather cranky comment, by uh, someone who had been a professor of English literature at Cairo University, Meher uh, Shafi uh, Farid, who served as a translator both into Arabic and into English within Lotus and within the anthology and also a, uh, a reviewer. And he says that he cannot say that he liked what he was offered. He disliked it a great deal because he had been mentored at Cairo University in the Anglo-American New Criticism tradition. And uh, there were only a very few texts, he claims, that he felt any sympathy with, any rapport with, like a uh, Blind Owl by Sadiq Hidayat. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so um, let me now turn to the paratexts of the anthology. Um, and I'm referring, as I mentioned, to the editorial material surrounding the actual corpus of the poems, um, the paratext as the threshold in Gerard Genet's uh, term of the vestibule, um, and how it is that uh, they provide access to the traces of shaping of conceptualizations, tentative, provisional, uh, if you wish, of what it is that Afro-Asian literature might construe. And I will begin with the least unassuming paratextual elements. I'll begin really with the back of the volumes, and these are the biographies uh, of the poets, the biographical notes. Um, let's see. So this is the first uh, page of the biographical notes. You have the Algerian poet Malik Haddad, who's being praised for the modernization of the genre of poetry and novel in Algerian literature. And this is a purely uh, literary critical uh, gloss. And there is no reference here to anything in the vein of socialist realism, for example. It's, uh, it's the modernization. <clears throat> Excuse me. His compatriot, Anna Gerki, is praised for her poetic contribution to Algerian poetry of resistance. This is a completely different register then. Uh, it's the poetry of resistance, it's literature engagée, it's commitment. Um, <clears throat> significantly, there is no ethnic descriptor for her. She is Algerian. Uh, she is of French descent when you look her up. Um, and had considered herself Algerian and had fought for independence and was impris imprisoned by the French. And so <clears throat> on account of this identification and this history, she is completely uh, categorized as Algerian. And then you get Augustino Neto, and I'll refer to him later, who had not yet become president of Angola. Uh, and he would become the winner of the Lotus Prize, um, 
uh, his political role is highlighted totally in keeping with the solidarity and support offered by both Afro-Asian institutions to the Angolan anti-colonial struggle. And then if you look towards the bottom of the page, you have Reverend Jean Metiba, who is, whose um, gloss says, great depth and mysticism characterize the works of this poet, though little is known about him. There are these biographies and glosses that I personally find really moving all through the bios. Little is known about this person, but you know he seems to have a uh, propensity towards mythology. He seems to like mysticism. This poem we, we anthologize does that, this and that. And it gives us pose on two counts. If little is known about him, uh, then you know this is a phrase that you might expect in an anthology of pre-modern poetry, let's say, uh, of or maybe pre-print cultures. Maybe uh, you would associate it with the Greek anthology, the unknowns. Uh, what is an unknown doing here? Is this tokenism per Leah Price's uh, description of anthologies? And where do we place any canon forming gesture associated with the creation of anthologies vis-a-vis -vis an unknown person? Uh, should we dispense with the, anthology, the assumption that this anthology is producing a canon? And then the bio is surprising because of mysticism, the reference, of mysticism, the reference to mysticism in an anthology of Afro-Asian writers' solidarity. Uh, we might even uh, look uh, below where you have the final bio on that page that makes perfect sense. You know, this is what you would have expected before combing through the bios. Uh, this uh, writer, uh, Epanya Yondu, uh, was born in 1930 in Tuaya. He was imprisoned in the course of his fight for liberation. He wrote the poem Anthologized in the prison prison of New Bell in 1949, completely different from the reference. Uh, okay, let's look at, the, at one more page. Here, for example, you have Faiz, Ahmed Faiz, a very well-known um, uh, Pakistani poet who was involved in Lotus even before he became the editor, as I mentioned, during, during the Beirut period. Um, Sorry, uh, Hala, um, just have to warn you, to try to wrap it up because we are a bit, uh, um, because we would like to have some time for questions as well. If, if, if so, um, just a warning. <laughs> sure, may I ask how Sorry. much time? No problem. How much time do I have? Uh, I mean, uh, it, yeah, it was uh, half an hour. We were supposed to keep within half an hour plus 15 minutes discussion. So now it's, uh, it's, it's been 37 minutes uh, for, of you talking, so uh, yes, uh, it it's like me. five more minutes, uh, but then we will have very uh, little time for discussion. Sanya, it serves me right because I'm the one who said let's stick to the program to the extent possible. Okay, so the bios are uh, exemplary of the way in which uh, little is uh, there is little setting of store by. Uh, the question of individual authorship. And if we look at the acknowledgements, the bottom of the acknowledgements, we have the a description of how it is that texts are obtained at conferences uh, through little known magazines and, and uh, uh, that are very ephemeral, the whole mood and atmosphere of these hubs. And if anything, and this is to hark back to our previous talk, it, it gives one a sense of a literary commons as opposed to uh, individual authorship and copyright issues. And um, uh, fascinatingly, if we were to move, if we had had the time to move to the preface as such by Edward al Harrat, we would find that uh, there are these moments when uh, any form of Afro-Asian essentialism is, uh, is being rejected uh, eliminating the slightest doubt of any uh, racial uh, slant in reverse. 
okay, that is part of uh, his positioning and a dig against negritude. And instead, um, you have a statement of all variety. We start from a basic uh, premise that the core of human culture is one and uh, global. All variety is a source of richness and completeness. Um, I would have gone on to parse more his preface and to select a poem by Nehet Selim in, in her translation by Mahmoud Darwish, but I believe I should wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this really, really uh, interesting. And I, I, I couldn't, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, not a good feeling to, to, uh, to try to uh, stop you. Uh, but we are trying to, um, uh, to, to keep some time for, for questions, uh, uh, partly also because uh, your uh, presentation and uh, the questions that you opened are, I think, very uh, in a very interesting way related to other um, topics that uh, occurred um, in uh, in previous in yesterday and today and um, uh, I will uh, ask uh, people uh, the participants uh, to uh, pose uh, the questions we have some time uh, so um, I believe that there was something in the uh, in the chat no uh, okay so, uh, okay, um, in, that, in that way, I will have uh, one of my <laughs> questions um, or uh, maybe uh, comments and try to bring uh, things together. Uh, I find it very interesting and maybe you could, we could hear uh, your comment about, uh, because uh, given your uh, perspective, uh, that is, I would say, rooted also in, a, in uh, uh, investigating the question of labor behind the cultural production uh, in this context. Um, uh, I think that it's interesting to look at all of these um, meeting points or points of uh, 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 or, or points of intersection in this global uh, uh, context, uh, like um, the anthology similar to museum that we spoke of uh, in the previous session, or the perennial exhibitions uh, that we spoke of yesterday, um, as uh, some kind of maybe a, yeah, a redefinition of those institutions, if we could call them that way, of the, that were uh, inherited from previous system, from bourgeois uh, system, but then uh, somehow reinvented or uh, reconfigured to fit the, the, the new propositions of the, of the also of new uh, ideological understanding of, um, uh, of the cultural production. Uh, so maybe if there is a comment uh, on your side on uh, uh, such other phenomena, uh, we were also discussing in the last, um, uh, in the last uh, session about uh, the Museum of Solidarity, uh, of how a museum was built uh, on uh, different principles than the ones based on a market economy, but on more of a gift economy on of exchanging this, uh, 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 these artworks. Uh, and uh, how would you maybe relate this, uh, or how would you discuss uh, this, uh, this different phenomena in, from that perspective? These are very rich questions. Thank you so much, Sanya. Um, the, uh, the anthology and the museum is such a broad and, and the, the exhibition is such a broad question. I would just point out a few um, details that I would maybe later use to build an answer towards that, which has, a, for example, the visual archive of Lotus, the, the, uh, the artists who contributed illustrations to it. I would also point to a sort of alternative form, alternative, I should insert a question mark, perhaps uh, alternative form of the exhibition of culture in parallel with the Afro-Asian meetings, where it is that they go, uh, what activities uh, are charted for them, tours, uh, uh, the role of folklore, which is resonates between um, uh, material objects and it also uh, echoes within one of what was to become a permanent section within Lotus, which is a, a whole section on folklore, highlighting 
uh, folkloric uh, traditions and the poems, etc., from from different Afro Asian countries. So uh, this is one. Uh, uh, these are some provisional details that I put out there for consideration uh, regarding what it all means now, which has been uh, occupying us, particularly in the previous session and and in in, in general in the past two days. Um, this is maybe a personal anecdote, but I spent part of the lockdown in New York writing an article called Bandung at 65, which was a, a very wholesome way of uh, going through that lockdown, but simultaneously asking myself what it means to visit, revisit Bandung at 65. And um, continuities, for example, that came to mind uh, amid what was then the mask war that, and, and later we would see the vaccine war, et cetera, was uh, for example, the Cuban doctors and the work of solidarity that they did, particularly say in Italy. And that is, that is in a line of descent from this whole moment. So as opposed to the model of competition, uh, you have the model of uh, solidarity work. And maybe I should just, um, wrap up here because I see that someone has a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Miguel uh, uh, has a hand up. So please, please, Miguel. Well, thank you, Prof Professor Halim. It's been a, a, an incredible presentation and all the questions that you pose uh, at the side of what you are saying, are thing, uh, I think, I believe they are central of what we are trying to do here. Uh, my, my question is, is about your comment or, and, and your work on, on issues of translation and interpretation uh, when working with, uh, within this frameworks of comparative literature or, or what we do also in, in art and culture, comparative <laughs> cultural realms. And, and the limits that that, that uh, discipline uh, brings to us, right? Uh, but also the incredible possibilities that also uh, bring. Uh, I've been working with indigenous uh, cultural producers for the past decade. And, and uh, one of the issues is language, right? Because language uh, works within this realms of, of hegemonic languages, romance languages, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, small languages. But then in the in the processes of translation, you find the possibility of, of translating some of these concepts that will uh, do or give new configurations to concepts like solidarity, for example, or what you were saying about uh, uh, well be, uh, living well, right? Like you know, what indigenous peoples in the Americas will call summa causae, that suddenly has also political translations within uh, new political configurations in, in the Americas. And just a comment on, on, on the issue of language uh, potentials, limits, and, and our challenges. Absolutely. I mean, this is a very relevant comment, I would say, and it was uh, beyond translation, you had a lot of questions uh, being debated within the pages of Lotus itself about hegemonically carved out official national language versus, let's say, idioms uh, or, you know, the, the old saying about uh, a language as, as being uh, an, an, uh, a dialect with an army. Um, you had that, you had questions of multilingualism and bilingualism being debated in the Afro-Asian Writers Association conferences. And uh, it it is a very interesting early, um, discussion of issues that uh, that later come to be to be broached within post-colonial theory uh, certain debates become enshrined like Ngugi with Yungu and uh, Chinua Shebe but they had been around earlier uh, and uh, it certainly uh, it augurs uh, south south comparatism in the moment of comparative literature uh, thank you for that Miguel Uh, okay, thank you uh, for the question and the answer. It's uh, we are now uh, actually waiting for Isabel to um, to arrive. I if she is here uh, under another name, I would ask her to uh, uh, 
to, to reveal her identity. Um, I, I was uh, in communication with her on email and she said that she will be just in time for her presentation because she uh, was uh, working uh, on something else. Uh, and I hope that she will arrive. So um, uh, until that time, uh, I guess we can continue. Uh, we'll, we'll have more time to discuss. Uh, if Hala, you are still here, if you can be uh, with us a bit a bit longer. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's very difficult to, to to uh to make timing in, in this in the under these circumstances but uh, please please go on uh -huh. yeah uh so uh, i invite others uh, to join uh, the the conversation about your paper i wanted to make a, a also a comment or a, also question for you if you have been at all looking at uh, contexts uh, like um, this kind of translation practices uh, among other um, um, con countries, uh, but also uh, continents of, we could call them the cultural context, um, uh, apart from Afro-Asian, uh, what you presented on. I'm, uh, of course, also uh, thinking of, while listening to you, what was uh, the production in Yugoslavia during the non-alignment um, and uh, how rich, actually, the, the literature uh, mm, uh, production in the field of literature was at the time um, in the context uh, of a country that uh, didn't have a previous um, uh, contacts uh, with the uh, with cultural contacts uh, with the countries of uh, African or Asian countries. No, uh, there was no uh, legacy of a direct uh, colonial legacy as in other European countries. So there was no this kind of. So all of a sudden, you had also anthologies or certain kind of. Uh, mm, uh, po poetry very often uh, comprised in uh, books uh, mm, edited to, together with other forms of uh, artistic production uh, as well, uh, like visuals, uh, etc., uh, that are speaking to the broader public about the cultural, uh, uh, about the culture of non-aligned countries and uh, different contexts. But what I see as a great difference, apart from what you were saying is that there was uh, mm, uh, there was not a such a horizontal approach to this task so there was not an anthology of let's say Yugoslav African uh, or you know like um, comprising it and looking it at the same level it was always somehow um, uh, put in a uh, in a in a uh, in a context of African art or uh, Asian art, etc. So uh, I think it is uh, interesting to to look at those uh, those differences, um, and um, also in that context, looking at uh, how um, the work of translators, uh, especially in the context of Yugoslav uh, production of the Slavic countries that didn't really have scholarship of linguistic or uh, cultural linguistic uh, background in these con countries, how uh, this was functioning. I'm speaking from a perspective of an art historian, not a literature <laughs> um, historian, but uh, I think it's very, very also relevant for for uh, the field of visual arts, uh, if we look at translation as a princip principle uh, of uh, work in cultural production. But I'm, maybe if, if you want to respond, but there is also a question of uh, Liliana, who raised hand, so I will um, give a uh, uh, word to her. Hello. Hello. It was a wonderful presentation, really, and uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I, I will, this is actually a kind of comment um, building on what Tanya says. I think it might be very interesting for you actually, unfortunately it's, it's published on Serbian. Just a moment, I think I'm too, too, uh, okay. I hope you can hear me now better. So um, that was in 1980 as a kind of introduction to the, I think it was 2040 UNICEF Congress in Belgrade. There was a huge conference uh, bringing together people from Africa, Asia, and Yugoslavia. And one of the main topics of discussion were the problems of translation. And it was very interesting to hear first 
it's 1980, <clears throat> it's that surge of neo-colonialism to see how it's reflected on the, on the, on the, on the, on the process of, of uh, decolonization of culture and how the economy is used for repressing the literature on native languages, for example. From the point of view of Africa, there were like representatives of 19 African countries discussing mostly the literature which that was written and published in native languages. And then there was also the other side, Yugoslav translators. And the very interesting thing, there's a kind of a common standpoint of Yugoslav translators is that the choice of the titles that are translated from African and Asian literature are actually uh, is actually defined by Eurocentric uh, Yugoslav education. So that that it that it is it is founded on uh, on the story of European literature on big names of the European literature, and that from that point of view, they define the criteria for for translating. African, Asian, and Latin American literature. I would say Latin American literature was a little bit different. Um, it was also the subject of complaints at that uh, talk. It was, um, the other very interesting thing is that for the first time I've heard, uh, you, you find in this uh, transcript of that conversation, the information about Yugoslav translators who are going to African and Asian countries on their own to learn the language and to try to translate from the language at, it, at which the literature was written, not from the French or English sources. And um, of course there are complaints about the lack of support to such kind of self-education. With Arab literature, I think the situation was a little bit different. I didn't go deep into that topic but um, there was a kind of a change of administrative structure of Yugoslav society in the 1970s, which gave much greater independence to the republics uh, concerning their cultural exchange with uh, other countries, with the rest of the world. And it's very interesting to see a kind of the surge of uh, fellowships that people are using from Yugoslavia to learn Arab language, for example, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Algiers. Uh, and the knowledge then invested in the translation of, of the contemporary literature. So uh, uh, the one thing which I think is important for that conversation is a kind of um, openly speaking about uh, the situation that about that, um, I would say, a colonial aspect of Yugoslav approach to third world cultures, which should be discussed and it should be analyzed just to, to gain a more objective insight into Yugoslav politics of non-alignment, the entire politics. And when I mentioned Latin American literature, it's interesting that at the end of the 70s and the beginning of 80s, there was a surge of translations from Spanish with new Latin American literature. Borges was a very important person. And there were even in, in Croatian, for example, in Croatian contemporary literature, there is um, a group of artists which named themselves Borges School. So the, the contemporary Latin American literature was really widely read, very popular, and uh, when you compare the, the, the locations from which the translations are coming, then it's in, in the 70s and 80s, it's actually Latin America. At the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s, uh, 60s it's India. And uh, um, Afro-Asian, uh, the literature of the North Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, Algiers, and the Middle East is, um, becoming more interesting and more translated at that point from the mid seventies on. So these are just some historiographical facts, but I think one, it would be, it would be interesting to translate this conversation since it involved, involved the views from so, so many different points, locations within NAM to see how they actually 
translations works. When uh, Sanya mentioned that there wasn't a, a comparative uh, anthology, poetic uh, anthology of poetry, Yugos Yugoslav and contemporary African literature, there was one. It was published at the beginning of 80s in a very small publishing house in Čačak, a very small town in Serbia. It's very interesting, but it was also uh, discussed on some later conferences on cultural, trans on translation that, held, that were held in Yugoslavia until mid 1950s. If we, uh, I think we could make some, some at, at least rough translation and eventually send you that transcript. I would be most grateful and I would love also the reference uh, to the volume you were mentioning. And I think there are also very interesting resonances uh, and um, something uh, quite heartening about the fact that these translators wanted to do direct translation, yeah. not through a relay, because that, that's a question that haunts the Afro-Asian Writers Association. The, the, this, the fact that very often they are presented with material that's already translated or do not have the linguistic skills to, re to deal with the original uh, language. So I think this is very heartening. And I was curious about the Latin American, does the uh, shift and in interest in Borges and so on, does it coincide with the Latin American boom uh, in the West? I mean, there's the boom. Uh, yes. Is it? Yes, is absolutely. That? One thing which is also interesting, uh, I think that perhaps uh, um, I'm a generation that, that I'm a generation of the 60s. And uh, it's also connected with the, with the movies. Um, uh, Yugoslav TV was uh, regularly broadcast casting movies from the East Europe, Central Europe, Africa, Asia, and so on. So I believe that uh, anyone, anyone from uh, anybody that was born in the 60s and the 70s has, uh, has seen the trilogy of Apo, for example, or um, a, a series of Latin American films that were dealing with them like very, very sensitive class, but also gender issues that were produced at the beginning of the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s. So the literature actually opened the door to other cultural forms and other types of cultural production. That was also um, very interesting. It is certainly part of that wave of interest that was flooding West Europe. And it would be also very interesting to, to, to see, um, but it's for some other discussion, how the, the, the production of the OSPAL posters, which we are expecting to, to see from Isabel, also affected and changed the way of represent, uh, representation of you, heroes of Yugoslav, uh, 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 Yugoslav um, liberation struggle bringing the form, I'm, I'm now talking about the form, about the references to pop art, bring, bringing that kind of a, of a memory and commemoration closer to the affinities and, and tastes of the younger generation. So Latin America has a really very interesting institutional and extra institutional impact on, on, on Yugoslav culture of the 70s and 80s. Let's <laughs> We don't hear you. No. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, uh, it's these are fascinating connections, and I wish uh, I could uh, uh, have access to this material to be able to read it, to be able to follow. I wonder if anyone has written about the anthology, for example, that you mentioned. Uh, no, I don't think so because it was mentioned in that transcript, but as a kind of. Um, a kind of a, a weird situation, uh, un unusual. Uh, but uh, it is, a, a, I think that uh, when one of the, of, the, of the outcomes perhaps of this entire workshops, a workshop um, opens a lot of questions. One of them is, is it possible to just concentrate on visual and not to take into account the literature, translations, film, and also a TV production that was the, like a main mean of informing Yugoslav citizens about Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, if when we start with such kind of research and find the elements that might, uh, the sources that might in interest you, we shall send it to you.
Please, yes. Thank you yeah. very much. I'd be most grateful. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Liliana, for these comments. And uh, I just want to, uh, to say with great uh, regret uh, that it seems that Isabel uh, Pante is not here with us. I was on email uh, with her uh, maybe an hour ago, and she said that she will come uh, right at the time, but she isn't here. So uh, we have more time to discuss and to uh, open new questions and maybe to wrap up the whole seminar. I will use, I, I see that Miguel has... Uh, uh, has uh, has uh, raised his hand, uh, but I will use opportunity to just stick a little bit more on Hala your um, uh, the questions that you uh, open and one uh, that I find very important and I think it also appeared before but not uh, explicitly so is the question of uh, women uh, agency and women uh, labor uh, uh, as you uh, presented it in uh, this kind of. Um, uh, in, in this kind of uh, cultural production. Um, and I find it interesting that um, uh, your focus on uh, these paratextual elements uh, of the production are basically crucial for revealing the role of women, I guess, uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of project. Uh, as it is the case in other, in other fields, completely different fields of cultural production, like architecture, for example, or urban planning or um, different kinds of institutional running of the institutions as such as some certain kind of uh, collective project. Um, uh, obviously, uh, these kind of authorship is invisible as it uh, as the Western canon insists on the on the genius artist, right? Um, but uh, from that perspective, it, it seems uh, even more relevant to uh, to open up these uh, uh, the, the, these uh, hidden uh, corners of uh, of uh, uh, of these production, as you mentioned. So maybe the question would be: of you did give us some hints on your methodology, but how do we how do we approach um, how do we even uh, uh, find out about these uh, uh, agents um, uh, and how do we approach them since uh, there is very often a lack of material in the archives and if we are if we are lucky enough uh, we uh, these people are alive we can talk to them sometimes we cannot even talk to them so how would you um, uh, what is your comment on the methodological aspects of this Uh, we don't hear you, sorry. <laughs> okay, I was saying that it's a rather vexing problem, uh, particularly if, for example, you're dealing, part of what you're dealing with is um, uh, interpretation and uh, there, there are no recordings. I wish, or at least I know of no recordings. I wish I had transcripts uh, or recordings of, of the labor of the interpreters in general, and there were some men included. Um, I have been lucky in this particular case in the, in the sense that I've, met, I've found some of the translators, I've uh, interviewed them, um, and uh, I think it's, it's it, it, there is a question of broadening out, of thinking of how it is that, uh, after a certain gravitation from a given career into another career or after retirement or what have you, there is a kind of outpouring of, of memories, whether in the form of a memoir or in the form of letters and so on. So I found material that in, in very, um, in uh, somewhat unexpected places that uh, I had not been um, looking into specifically for the Afro-Asian. And um, I think ephemeral magazines, adjacent magazines, adjacent uh, newspapers, material that seems to be least directly of, of relevance is where you often find alternative histories, uh, where you find a telling anecdote rather than an official narrative. Uh, adjacent material is, is always uh, very use useful and the more ephemeral, the more um, I find uh, yields promise of uh, a different angle on, on one, what one is dealing with. Um, 
And so, I mean, it's, it's essentially these oral histories I've been conducting, the ephemeral material, the, uh, of the belated memoirs, like for example, there is um, Fakhri Labib, uh, may he rest in peace. He was part of the, uh, he was an Egyptian leftist who died in 2016 and who started uh, working at APSO, the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Association, not long after Edward Farrat retired. And this is a moment when the uh, Afro-Asian uh, Writers Association is no longer in Cairo. And Fakhri Labib being a geologist an activist and a writer is very much part of the team that is starting to try and reclaim uh, the association and reinvent uh, Lotus. And so I, I'm interviewing him someday and he says, you know, I've just finished my memoir. Uh, and uh, it so happens that it's about the, or oh, most of it, not entirely, about his trips through uh, the Afro-Asian People Solidarity Organization. And it, it has fascinating glimpses about a period that is still a bit mysterious when, uh, you know, you have the um, uh, perestroika, you have the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you have a kind of pertur perturbation, if you wish, of where certain projects will go, where they will land, if they will land anywhere. And you have, uh, um, for example, this question of Lotus, so, and the question of the Writers Association, and so it becomes like a, a black box, a memoir that's unpublished to this day, I seem to have the only copy of it. <laughs> it, it seems to have disappeared, I translated a portion and published it, I hope to publish the rest of it, but I don't know if that gets at your question, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it does, thank you. There is only uh, resources that we can get. It's obvious that uh, um, only the material traces or the li living contacts can be uh, the source for uh, us who are dealing with the past. Mm, uh, but uh, yes, thank you, thank you. I think it was more of a looking at a sharing experience, uh, uh, myself coming from a similar uh, inquiries, but uh, different. Uh, maybe a bit of a different scope, not so global. Um, I will now give word to Miguel, who has been waiting uh, to, uh, to pose a question or comment, please. Oh, thank you, Sanja. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, yeah, unfortunately, Isabel is not here because we were always, all, all, everybody was waiting for, him, for her to, to tell us about these posters because they, they will somehow put together visually uh, many of this, uh, discussions uh, but going on the methodological aspects uh, and following uh, professor halim's uh, suggestion uh, and uh, I, we really appreciate again the invitation of your two institutions to think through uh, uh, noam right and what an archival of noam would look like right uh, because it doesn't exist in location anywhere uh, because it comprises all these layers uh, of, of somehow interaction and exchange through the time, right? We can just say, okay, there is a point of origin in here, 1955, Rom, they're abandoned all the way through. But here we're dealing again with an alternative geopolitics, let's say the geopolitics of the South, right? Or when a number of uh, writers from North Africa uh, come into connection and in, in, in touch with uh, the writers and intellectuals from uh, the former Yugoslavia, for example. That's a very particular and interesting uh, spin or how uh, Southeast Asians uh, start connecting with uh, the South Americans, uh, et, et cetera. I mean, it's, the geopol it's an alternative geopolitics uh, that, that are built fortunately on quote unquote, and I wanna bring this into, into conversation with the rest of, of, of participants, uh, quote unquote, in a very modern way, right? Because we are talking about a number of cultural producers that are aligned to the left, right? And Marxism, right? Uh, that is a modern construct uh, that, that actually has its own institutional organizations, right? Writers' associations, uh, 
artists, uh, uh, communes, etc. Right, and they do meet. I mean, they believe in collective uh, uh, organizing. And as in the process of collective organizing, they do a lot of meetings and they do produce a lot of the soft uh, materials, right? All these minutes and all these things. We have an advantage, right, also, uh, that is the audiovisual production, the explosion of audiovisual production at the time, right, from the 1950s on, right, the explosion of, of TV right, as a modernizing tool from the capitalist spaces, but then re the, the re-engineering of that as forms of, right, we know propaganda in many cases through, you know, nation building in many of our areas of interest, countries of interest, and, and diplomacy, right. Diplomacy is also a very important way because many of these encounters were made through diplomatic ties, right? Because the idea of constructing this alternative geo, geo, geo policy uh, was to create this networks of solidarity ba based on exchange, economic exchange, right? We need to open our borders to exchange, not to be dependent from, you know, North American and European powers, but to start creating our own industries, etc. Blah 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 blah. Uh, then there is lots of, of of materials also in this diplomatic archives, um, because through them, right, we see all these cultural exchanges. Right, uh, the fact that. Liliana was saying how in the former Yugoslavia you were uh, getting to know what was going on in North Africa through documentaries. Same thing here in Latin America, right? Uh, in Cuba or in Colombia, my, my home country, uh, we got to know the people of the world through our participation in the non-aligned movement, right? And all the materials that came into our cultural, uh, our cultural uh, channels uh, that were all institutional. Then audiovisual production, uh, cultural production, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, reports and accountings, and all of, all of them are official, let's say, and they, they reside in different archives. The, the things that we have to diversify uh, our archival, uh, archival inputs uh, to try to you know, go through those uh, all their spaces, uh, right? Um, and then uh, one of my, my questions for Professor Halim is also the issue of the oral, right? The oral traditions, because the, the, the nations of the South, we, we I mean, uh, the imposition of, of the, we call la letra, the letter, the print letter, Right, it's an imposition, as an hegemonic imposition, right? A colonial way to uh, tell what there is in, in, in these territories of the colonized, uh, right? The savage doesn't have a written word. But then we had this emergence of oral literature. Uh, in Latin America, we call it ora literatura, right? That has been moving for three and four decades that actually started in Africa with the uh, meetings of African writers precisely talking about these issues, that they don't feel represented in the translations of their words because their words res reside on the oral traditions and the trans 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 transmission of, of knowledge is through rituals that are performatic, audiovisual, em embodied uh, uh, ways of producing knowledge and through the oral word. And, and now we have this emergence of, of generations of new writers uh, calling themselves aura writers uh, and uh, a production that is parallel, uh, that is still in conflict with, with the mo most hegemonic editorial houses and because it's, it's an issue of market, right? And the, the Latin American boom was a market, uh, a huge market of, of a number of a generation of writers that became well-known globally because they had agents, right, in Europe promoting them, right? Or they were exiled because of the political alliances, they moved into Europe and then they found uh, a, pol a Polishing houses. Then they, they found a way to, 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 to show their work and then created a market that, that you know, created this uh, interest. Same thing with 
Africans coming in exile, South Asians, right, during, uh, during the, uh, the 1970s. I mean, it, we, we, we have to talk a bit about this alternative geopolitics of the South and see if we can use it as a methodological tool to understand uh, creating our own maps and try to identify these ways to, to, to move forward. But thank you, just comments for, for the uh, work in the future. Thank you very much. And I mean, a, a, a very briefly, I'd say that it, it was a possibly a, a good idea that the first of the anthologies was a poetry one. Thank you so much for all this uh, rich survey of oratory and the oral traditions and the question of how they vex a notion of a textualized archive um, and uh, the paradigms that we bring to bear on uh, the material that we deal with from the South and whether inadvertently we are dealing with Eurocentric paradigms. And I think that just two very brief notes because I, uh, I think I don't want to take too much of your time. The fact that the anthology, for example, the very first anthology was one of poetry made a lot of sense, uh, given that poetry is really the most indigenous, uh, one of the most indigenous forms. And given that it sidesteps, you know, altogether the whole um, boom, if you like, in theorizations about novel and nation that would come in later, you know. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very ancient genre and very very flexible, very, uh, very uh, responsive to, the, to different traditions. Um, and then I, I did mention the folklore section and in Lotus and how you have, for example, Kibil uh, oral um, uh, narratives, how you have Alexandrian fishermen songs, etc., an attempt at bridging that. But these are just two very quick notes. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, now we have a change of the situation. Uh, Isabel uh, uh, appeared, but my uh, suggestion is now, uh, since we already started this discussion, uh, thinking that uh, she would not uh, be with us, that we finish uh, with, uh, we have uh, uh, raised hands uh, by uh, uh, three more people, that we finish this uh, in time of uh, the, the expected time, the uh, half past seven, and then uh, give the floor to Isabel to uh, give her presentation if somebody can stay. I am aware that we all have our schedules, but if somebody can stay, we are luckily on Zoom and we are uh, we have uh, patience of our technical support to stay longer. So I think this is the solution that we can, uh, we can offer. And I would now uh, give uh, the uh, word to um, uh, Boyana. I think uh, Boyana was the first. Or Lina, I'm not sure I was uh, maybe Lina. Lina, Lina. okay, Lina, uh, if you could. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm here. Hi. Sorry, I wasn't able to raise hand. Oh, sorry, I have a weird background that my son put on. Uh, I just wanted to say on the on the topic of gender and the non-aligned movement, just to the, draw your attention to the fact that, and I've written to, to your project about this, I am sitting here with an archive of hundreds of documents uh, from Olya Druverovic, who was my aunt and who was the head of the commission for the uh, assistance of uh, the liberation movements of the Socialist Alliance of um, Yugoslavia. I have this archive, I'm beginning to work with the Museum of African Art in Belgrade, and it is a fantastic archive. I haven't said much because I'm about a tenth through it and I'm cataloging it at the moment, but there's been so many uh, moments during today, I wasn't able to attend yesterday, where I have seen documents within the archive that would be relevant, that would be of interest. We are looking at it in relation to gender because uh, there's so much work that's being done by a number of women that was sort of in the background or not, non, not fully realized publicly, if you like. So this is something I'd really like to continue discussing with you. So I just wanted to make that note and to sort of begin a uh, conversation with yourselves about that. Amazing, thank you so much, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for, uh, for keep talking. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Hala, did you want to say something? No, just wanted to hear a bit more, perhaps later, mm -hmm. we can exchange emails and hear more uh, about this. This yes, archive. yes, that would be wonderful. Very thank you, thank you. Yes, very much. 
Okay, so now I will uh, uh, give uh, the word to Bojana Lidekanic. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, just a couple of comments about the conversation that was uh, uh, around uh, Professor Halim's uh, presentation um, and some of the co comments that were uh, made or uh, questions that were made uh, that were posed uh, around that presentation. So number one, I would say that um, the comment that I would make is that uh, Yugoslav artists didn't uh, suddenly uh, find out about, you know, non-aligned in 1961 or even the 1950s, um, they knew and were well-read in non-Western literature before World War II. A reason of, for that is that like many of the uh, Latin American and African artists, they uh, attended schools in Europe. So there was a lot of intermingling, for example, uh, in Paris. Um, this is all documented. Um, and uh, Anya, uh, what's her name? Um, Anya uh, Jovich Humphrey has written a, a great text on Amy Cesare and Croatian uh, translator, writer, educator, uh, Petr Guberina, uh, where they knew each other uh, in the 1930s and, and 20s and 30s in Paris. And, and in fact, Amy Cesare was, started his first draft of his uh, book in uh, on the Dalmatian coast. So, uh, and that's not the only example, and especially with Latin America. Um, so, I would I would say that um, this non-aligned connections and knowledge does not come out of nowhere, out of vacuum. In fact, is a continuation of the work that artists, writers were doing well before World War II. Also, Yugoslavia was a known political entity in the anti-imperialist struggle. Um, so the League, um, anti-imperialist League that was already formed prior to World War II um, was already talking about the Balkans and Yugoslavia in the context of anti-imperialism. Um, unfortunately, none of the Yugoslavs communists could attend because at the time when they were uh, discussing Yugoslavia, the, uh, Yugoslavia was under dictatorship and most communists were in jail, so they couldn't attend. But that didn't stop the, the delegates at the, uh, at, the, um, at the leagues, one of the leagues um, uh, 1929 meeting to have uh, a resolution about Yugoslavia. So this whole question around Yugoslav participation in the NAM is a much longer one, and it did not uh, come out of the vacuum of Cold War. So that's number one. Um, and number two, I would like to challenge this idea of Yugoslav so-called participation in a colonial project. Th this, this has been criticized quite heavily by my colleague Tanya Petrovic, who has written an excellent uh, article about this, challenging this new uh, newly emerging idea that somehow Yugoslavia was participating in colonial um, or somehow took on these colonial ideas um, when it interacted with its non-aligned partners. So I would like to call to her work, Ljubica Spaskovska, who was here, also has done um, similar work on the economy, as, the, as has um, my colleague uh, Nikola Radonic, who's written about Yugoslav, um, Yugoslav um, state and the students um, um, who were coming from non-aligned countries to Yugoslavia. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an emerging criticism of this and I would like to challenge it. Um, and number three, when we come to Eurocentrism, all non-Western artists, uh, uh, creators were struggling with the same idea because they were all forced by the colonial imperial powers, they were forced to speak in the language of the colonizer. Um, they were forced to be at, to attend uh, Eurocentric schools, art schools, because that was the system. And when we read the writings of uh, artists, for example, and I've been reading artists from uh, Nigeria who in the 1950s and 60s are struggling with this idea whose art are we going to look at? And some people were for Eurocentric art, in fact, in Nigeria in the 1950s and 60s, and others were. So we have very similar questions 
all across the non-Western world because all of these people had to contend with Eurocentrism, right? And they had to, they all knew different languages like French, German, Dutch, because those were the colonizer languages. So Yugoslavia is not somehow different. In fact, Yugoslavia fits and therefore is connected to this uh, language because of this. Um, and I think uh, Professor Halim's presentation really beautifully illustrates these questions and these, uh, these connections. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. This was most informative and enlightening. And I, uh, uh, it's all uh, completely new to me. The only thing I'd add is that I'm, uh, there is an affinity, a great affinity with what you were saying in terms of weaving back in time and seeing uh, rather than the big event uh, as the defining moment, looking at networks of um, students abroad, of um, uh, smaller meetings taking place. And for example, if, within the context I'm dealing with, uh, Indian Egyptian solidarities predate, far predate uh, Bandung. So um, I just throw out a title of a very uh, useful book. Uh, it's by Noor Ayman Khan, and I'll put it in the chat. It's called Egyptian Indian Nationalist uh, Collaboration and the uh, British Empire. And uh, she goes into all these student networks, uh, uh, periodicals um, that, again, uh, the, the sense of commonality between the two peoples uh, relating to the, the colonial situation and um, shifts between anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. It's, it's, a, it's a very compelling book. It's it also, there. sorry, it's also the question of the, the uh, uh, internationalization of the, of the surrealist movement, right? Mm -hmm. Which was so important for Egypt, but also in India and for Yugoslavia too. So there's that connection as well. Totally, totally, absolutely. And, and the impact of Africa on modernism, if you keep going back. Thank you, Boyana, so much. Uh, we were actually, we, the aim of this, uh, of this workshop is actually to reveal uh, these uh, similarities and connections. I don't think that anyone really challenged what you, what you spoke about. And um, uh, we are very uh, partially, uh, uh, we are very uh, well aware of the writers that you, that you referred to. And uh, yeah, it, but it is very interesting to also open up uh, and important, I would say, uh, to open up new possible perspectives um, and to do more and more research into the topics that, that, that were uh, here presented and that hopefully will be explored in great details in future. So I uh, see a hand by uh, Liliana. And then I suggest that we actually uh, wrap up with Liliana uh, as, uh, uh, and then have uh, the final presentation, unfortunately, that could not, that wasn't uh, in uh, the schedule of time, but uh, for all of you who would like to uh, hear Isabel Planta's presentation, we will uh, stick a bit longer here. So Liliana, please just very very uh, short and um, um, actually perhaps we can continue with this conversation after Isabel's presentation and discussion of her paper. Um, I, perhaps I was not precise enough, I was building on the, uh, on the concept of horizontal collaboration by Basil Kassou, um, um, director of the Center of African Cultures from Dakar, and it was the context in which the Eurocentrism of Yugoslav culture was discussed. It was. Uh, it is not uh, my statement. It is the the general conclusion of that discussion that was led in eighty, uh, in nineteen eighty, uh, to which subsume uh, almost uh, all the translators that were Yugoslav translators that were participating in that discussion. And um, um, I also think, as I, I support Sanya, that new perspectives are necessary. And I really don't think it's. Uh, it's it's uh, it's required or necessary to protect Yugoslavia from certain colonial aspects in its relation towards the countries of the third world. Let's be objective. Uh, Yugoslavia was very intensely involved with the politics of non-alignment, but in a number of situations, as all other countries, India, Algeria, Tunis Tunisia, Cuba, it put its own interests in front of the interests of the none. And uh, I think it is nothing like sacrilege 
when we talk about NAM, I think that uh, perhaps the more objective approach to NAM politics could do much more favor to, to, the, to, the, to the memory of the former country than uh, any kind of reification of its practices. So this is my comment. And we can, of course, postpone discussion on Basil's uh, concept of horizontal collaboration for later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zilena. And I would ask now Isabel Ponte to, um, to share the screen with us. Uh, are you here, Isabel, please? Can we hear you? <laughs> Yes, yes, I'm here. Hello. I'm here. I want first of all to apologize to you all for my for my for the mess I, I, I I've done with a with a time uh, schedule. Um, but I I'm I'm very honored to be here. I would love I would have loved to share the discussions, okay. but I was in the midst of uh, well a lot of work. I'm okay. very sorry. I hope there will be another opportunity to 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 get to to know you better and to and to okay talk. isabel i will uh, just uh, introduce you uh, uh, as i did uh, as we did with all of the <laughs> previous speakers so your uh, speech your presentation will be um, mm -hmm. about uh, it's called uh, between pop and polish uh, the circulation of Cuban posters uh, and the Cold War era. And um, uh, Elizabeth Puente holds a PhD in art history from U uh, the Universidad de, de Buenos Aires. She is a researcher of the National Scientific and Technical Research Council at the National University of San Martin, Argentina. She carried out her graduate studies thanks to a scholarship uh, granted by Conceit and the uh, Paul Getty Foundation at the, Institute, uh, at the National Institute of Art History in Paris. Her doctoral thesis was published in Argentina in 2013 as, um, uh, as Argentinas of Paris, uh, Art uh, and Cultural Travels during the 60s. Uh, she was visiting professor at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences Paris and visiting researcher at the Universidad de Estado do Rio de Janeiro and at the University uh, Universite de Grenoble uh, Alp. Her current investigation is titled International Circulation of Cuban Posters uh, and Chilean um, Artefilleras, um, Emblematic Latin American Visual Artifacts During the 60s and 70s. And it continues to focus um, on international exchanges, cultural and political identification, and geographic migration, geographical migrations of visual productions. Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth uh, the floor is yours. Thank you again. <clears throat> so uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for staying longer. I, I really apologize for this. And I, I will share part of the of, uh, an ongoing research about the um, worldwide circulation of the Cuban posters. And I will also apologize in advance for my awful pronunciation of the Polish names I, I'm about to, to mention. <clears throat> so, in a 1969 interview about Cuban posters, the painter and designer Raúl Martínez alleged that pre-revolutionary Cuba produced a good quality design that enriched the political poster production of the next, of the next decade. And I quote him, little by little, the institutions started to grow interest in design. First, Casa de las Americas, and next, the Revolutionary Orientation Committee understood that the political message did not have to be at odds with an adequate graphic solution or even, uh, or even one of high level." End of quote. Indeed, by the end of the 60s, several cultural and political institutions born from the Cuban Revolution were producing posters to promote their activities and their ethical values. The already mentioned Revolutionary Orientation Committee, uh, CORE, which I, which I will um, um, call CORE, like the, the, the shortened um, name, but also the Solidarity Organization of the People from Asia, Africa, and Latin America, OSPAAL, the National Council of Culture, the Casa de las Americas, and the Cuban Institute of Art and Cinematographic Industry, ICAIC, 
among others. The dissemination of posters within Cuba seems to have been a key factor in the transformation of national public spaces and in the identification of the people with different state programs. However, many of these posters also contributed to build up the image of the revolutionary Cuba abroad. In order to improve that growing graphic production and probably to continue to spread the good news about a fresh communist design, in 1970, the three renowned Polish designers, sorry, three renowned Polish designers visited Cuba to exchange with Cuban designers. Invited by the Re Revolutionary Orientation Committee, CORE, of the Cuban Communist Party, Bronislav Zelek, Victor Gorka, and Valdemar Berzi, sorry, spent time at the core graphic workshop with its team. They also gave lectures to different, uh, on different topics related to design, such as the history of Polish posters, the use of photography in poster making, printing techniques, and the color handling. These interventions were published as a series of articles in El Diseño, the magazine edited by the Corps. When articulating his opinion about the local posters production, Zelek made it clear that the following critiques grew from friendship with, Cuban, with his Cuban colleagues and shot, and I quote him. him. What, worries, what worries me in some of the works made by the cameras uh, is a certain superficiality, a carefree approach to the theme and the plastic form. In other posters, the excess of small forms and the accumulation of a great number of colors makes printing difficult, even more when the available technology for the comrades is quite primitive and imprecise. My advice is to make the work simpler. Many of us think that a poster needs to be subjective instead of pretty. The less nice looking, the more successful is a poster." End of quote. We don't really know which uh, the fake posters that Polish designers detected were. Maybe they looked like these not very successful core posters. These are the two could apply for the two colorful or two ornamental previous characterization. When looking at the differences between these 1969 and 1970 posters by Daisy Garcia, uh, one could, could imagine the effort of making it simpler as indicated by Celic in 1970, in his 1970 visit. In any case, among the posters developed at the core workshop before 1970, one can find examples of very synthetic, well-accomplished ones as well. That is the case of the series made by Ernesto Padron, Jose Papiol, and Faustino Perez for the 10th anniversary of Cuban Revolution. And these nowadays famous posters by Eufemia Alvarez and Alfonso Prieto and Padron again, or even these other, uh, sorry, or even these other posters calling to save electricity and oil made by Felix Beltran, the director of the core workshop since the mid sixties. Beltran was trained in New York at the School of Visual Arts and the New School of Social Research. In, 1970, in a 1971 interview, when asked about the specificity of Cuban posters, he mentioned, and I quote him, the need to find solutions to get around the material difficulties, the importation policies, the embargo, etc. Due to this lack of means, and it's his words uh, still, we do not use photography much, and the print runs of posters is not, are not as big as we would like. You must consider all this to understand the development of silk screen printing in Cuba. 
Hmm. Film posters printed at the ICAIC Steel Screen Workshop were very well considered by Shelek, Gorka, and Shvergy. Oh my gosh. Steel skin technique demanded a very precise artisanal work in order to get a well-adjusted register of several colors. That is the case, for example, of this, of this poster by Antonio Fernandez Reboiro, which needed many positives to print all these colors with perfect match. And that could also, <clears throat> and <clears throat> these two posters, sorry, that could also fit in into the critique hyperabundance of color. The visit of the three Polish designers was crowned with an exhibition that showed a selection of the work parallel to an anthology of Cuban posters. The contrast was apparently quite strong. Cuban writer Edmundo de Noes was empathic about, uh, about it in his article on that same issue of El Diseño magazine titled posters, uh, sorry, posters and the language of visual arts, Cuban posters versus Polish posters. And I quote him, this text that you're looking at. The three Polish designers suddenly put us in front of our undevelopment. All their 70 something exhibited posters show an homo homogeneous quality. They are well-studied ideas that were elaborated with time and graphic accuracy. In contrast to the evident heterogeneity in the quality of the Cuban production, the improvisation due, to, due partly to the pressing rhythm to the exigencies of the first years of revolution." End of quote. But there's no as <clears throat> also defended the strength and efficacy of the local production. And I quote him again. We tried this. On our way out of the exhibition, we asked us ourselves which posters we remembered sharply. Only two. One by Zelek for the, uh, for the 50 anniversary of October Revolution and the poster for Hitch, uh, Hitchcock movie, The Birds. Then we remembered vaguely just uh, the circus posters, humorous, uh, there were many of them, and two or three posters by Jerzy, oh my gosh, I can't, I'm so sorry, showing the last tendencies, linear drawing and flat colors, end of quote. The Hnoe's article included the reproduction of some of the mentioned posters on the left margins. The bad quality of the magazine printing that is visible in these images goes along with the enumerated technical limitations for the poster production in Cuba. What strikes me is that the Cuban posters on the right margin of the pages were able to survive precarity and they're still legible while the, sub the subtlety of Polish posters is lost and uh, with it the viability of understanding the represented themes and events. The reproduced Cuban posters had a strong connection with pop art and graphics. Pop graphics high impact strategy made it, made it easier to apprehend and to remember these posters, at least from this noise uh, perspective. And it was apt for printing and reproducing them in non sophisticated technical with non sophisticated technical means. The Ospal posters. On the upper left side of a photograph taken by Bruno Barbe during the student occupation in May 1968 inside the Institut de Politique in Paris, one can notice three small posters glued to one of the walls. On one of these posters, the inscription Viet and Nam printed in a solid font seem to be denting a flag of the United States as if it were a can. 
Another poster reads Black Power, the words written in white in an open jaws of a Black Panther. The visual languages of these posters is remarkably remarkably different from that of the other posters with photographic po portraits of Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, and Mao on that same wall. Those smaller posters had been created by the Ospal and had probably arrived to Paris, folded inside Tricontinental, a magazine which the disorganization had been publishing and sending to distant subscribers but by mail since 1967. The OSPAL, and, the, and this you probably all know, but let's just say it. The OSPAL was founded in Havana in January 1966 after the Tricontinental Conference, a meeting of 82 delegates from Guinea, Congo, South Africa, Angola, Vietnam, Syria, North Korea, Chile, Dominican Republic, and the Palestine Liberation Organization, among many others. Ever since its inception, the OSPAL agenda was to disseminate news about the anti-imperialist activities throughout the so-called Third World, as well as to implement propaganda actions to promote empathy and support toward the causes of liberation. In this regard, Vietnam's resistance to the US invasion as an emblematic case was, uh, sorry, an emblematic case that Ernesto Che Guevara in disguise in Bolivia used in his famous call published in Tricontinental to create two, three, many Vietnams. And I'm quoting Che Guevara. According to Swiss typographist, typographer, sorry, and activist Richard Frick, Tricontinental had an initial print run of 50,000 copies, which soon grew to 60,000 copies printed in Spanish, English, and French, reflecting the size that the organization expected to give to its internationalist mission. A collector of political posters, Frick, has done the most exhaustive cataloging of the OSPAL's graphics available to date, which gathers about uh, 350 posters. The, three, the first sorry, posters released in the magazine had a small format, reproduced portraits of three leaders of the struggle for liberation in Africa and in Latin America. Lumumba in Congo, Turcios in Lima, uh, Turcios Lima, sorry, in Guatemala, and Sandino in Nicaragua. In these first posters, the original inscriptions were replaced with translations into English of Fre or French but later, each poster would contain the same text in four languages, Spanish, English, French, and Arabic. The years between 1967 and 1970 were very prolific. The OSPAL created and sent abroad around 100 posters under, under the, art, the direction of Cuban designer Alfredo Rosgard who produced some remarkable posters using the folding as part of the design. Describing his visual strategies, Rothgar said, and I quote um, an interview, nobody walks the streets looking for posters. They have to call the attention of the passerby visually. To achieve this, I always use robust drawing in which color is at the service of form using strong contrasts that are inspired in the 1960s pop graphic. And always the famous black contour, end of quote. The production of posters came to complement or perhaps to initiate propaganda tasks by means of high impact images and design res resolutions that made it possible to understand which region, which region, sorry, was being alluded to, and depending on the case, what the conflict the conflict was about. To achieve the first, designers used similar resources to those of tourism posters, standardized iconic references to national, local, or ethnic cultures. However. These references were generally combined with representations of weapons, 
or various kinds of uh, an indicator of conflict, drastically marking their distance from the typical pleasant images using to promote tourist destinations. Frick, Richard Frick, the, the Swiss um, typographer I already mentioned, Frick's backgrounds are revealing to the international circulation of these posters. He says that he has been, he has seen, sorry, the Ospals poster for the first time at an exhibition in Zurich sometime in the first half of the 1970s. He remembers purchasing a few posters on that occasion. Among them, one about Laos by Ernesto Padron and the poster on Che Guevara's, uh, of Che Guevara, sorry, by Jesus for Hans Boade, which recaptures the Corda's emblematic portrait in typography style. After completing his studies on typography, Frick was able to take his first trip to Cuba in 1976. By then, he remembers, he was already acquainted with Rudolf Lutz's work on Cuban posters published in 1972, as well as with the German version of Dagal Stremer's book introduced by the landmark essay by Susan Sonder. According to Frick, Ospal's posters not only helped to create, and I quote him, a publicity counteroffensive, but also gave liberation movements their own authentic voice. These perceptions, widely shared at the time, may seem paradoxical or antithetical when considering the type of visuality in many of these posters. Close to pop or even to psychedelic prints in their synthetic resolutions uh, sorry, resolution of full and lively colors, Ospal's posters were frequently close to either the imaginary of the American way of life or the California, Californian counterculture. However, the authentic was not at odds with the potential to account for the vernacular in those languages and visual reper repertoires of international circulation. Visuality, the very fabric of the poster's images, accounted not only for Ospal's internationalist vocation, but for the deeply cultural consequences of imperialism. Pop was perhaps the only possible language to engage people around the world. Conceived in revolutionary Cuba, those tetralingual posters were meant to be disseminated worldwide. Pop was a counter contemporary attractive and ductile uh, visual style to convey vernacular themes and particularly suitable to address the public sphere, which was the source of most of the posters motifs, daily life, mass media, consumer society or polit political conjun conjunctions. We still have not found a list of sub subscribers for that period, but we do know, for example, that Emery Douglas, the artist from the Black Panthers, who collaborated with some posters designed by for Ospaal, received the magazine in the United States. In turn, Frick includes his catalog in his cataloging some forgeries that circulated in those years to discredit the Ospaal something that also contributes to getting a sense of the relevance of these posters in the peak years of third worldism. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Isabel, uh, for this very rich presentation. Uh, and I'm really, really glad that you managed to, that we managed to somehow get you and have you here. I am. Uh, I understand it's uh, this time difference, and um, yeah, it's um, it happens. Uh, but uh, luckily, we we uh, got the chance to hear you, and um, it's a really impressive uh, material. It's also uh, very interesting. You uh, pointed to the fact that it is um, 
at the beginning of your research, uh, kind of a more of a exploration of these connections. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, maybe a question um, to start with is how did you um, get interested in these connections and how, uh, how do you approach, how do you do the research? We were talking a lot about methodologies and the archives. Thank you, Sanya. Well, um... As you mentioned before, my PhD dissertation was about the interchanges, traveling and, uh, and, um, and also cultural identification of Argentine and South American artists in Paris during the 1960s. So then I, I got somehow into <laughs> the Atelier Populaire uh, production of, of posters during May 68. And reading the interviews made for, or, or to the French protagonists of those of, the, of that um, production, they would mention some anonymous, sometimes some names, but they would mention the artists I was I was studying in Paris as being like leading forces of of the Atelier Populaire's uh, pretty homogeneous um, images. So. It, it, it was around that that I started uh, working on posters because the other reference that was said at the time for that production, even if they don't really look alike, are, were the Cuban posters that were also circulated in French magazines and exhibitions and stuff. So that's how <laughs> I, got, I got into this. Mm. Uh, the, uh, about the archives, that's a very good issue. <laughs> and I think I share this with many of the present uh, researchers in the, in the, in the room. Um, well, I studied in France for these very simple reasons, <laughs> because I had the opportunity to go through those libraries and archives, which are very rich, not only in French materials, but in stuff from different places around the world. And um, I have a big problem on, on trying to put some limits to this very prolific uh, circulation, because if something, if the posters did something during those days was circulate, worldwide so what I what I what um what I decided after like uh, a while uh, was to focus on four or five cases or episodes that would help me understanding at least some aspects of that to, to, I mean, to try to make a history of the circulation or at least a, a part of that circulation, and to address some issues about the, the, um, the connection between production, circulation, and sense, in a way. I don't know if I, if I answered what what you were asking. Yes, it was a very general uh, question. I'm sorry uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, it is uh, indeed a very... Uh, important for uh, the research that we are conducting in this project to understand uh, these connections and how to approach uh, the diversity and the multitude of practices and interconnections. So I will now give a word to Diana Kolesnik, who um, wrote to me with a, with a comment that she has a comment yeah, um, yeah. on your, uh, on your uh, presentation, but also I would ask anyone if they have a question or a comment. If not, then maybe Giliana, uh, you can also wrap up uh, uh, wrap up the the, the whole uh, workshop. This is just a, just a comment um, <clears throat> on circulation of three continental and Oswald posters in Yugoslavia. Uh, it's very strange because the uh, when you when you go through the archives of uh, uh, archive in Yugoslavia concerning cultural exchange it seems that uh, cuba was a country with which yugoslavia had the most uh, intense cultural exchange in the field of visual arts in the beginning of, of the first half of the 60s and uh, but uh, if you go through the through the uh, through the libraries national libraries in yugoslavia you will not find any trace of three continental so it was yeah. a magazine that was circulated 
And um, uh, the only information which I have about the three continental fosters is the one I got from the people, I talked with a few people who were involved with the student resistance or student rebellion in Yugoslavia in 1968. And they mentioned the three continental fosters against the war in Vietnam that wow. was circulating within that circle of students at the Belgrade University, they renamed on that occasion Karl Marx University. Um, I, I didn't uh, have the possibility to talk with the, with the students, then students that were involved in the, in the resist in, in that rebellion in Zagreb and Belgrade Uni uh, Ljubljana University, but it'd be also very interesting to see if the same thing happened there. When I asked what was the source, where, where these posters came from, they didn't know, they just appeared. And I think the one of the, those is um, the poster, uh, which I have found also in Oslo's collection, cut off the hands of imperialism in, in, uh, in Vietnam. It was something because I was asking for the slogans and the, the person was not uh, able to remember but was mentioning Vietnam imperialism and so on. So perhaps it might be that posters because this fa that famous uh, uh, Che poster was published in 1969 when the rebellion was already finished. But uh, I think that there were a, a different, there are particular networks to which such material was circulating in Yugoslavia, three continental as well as the posters. Uh, um, Otherwise, I would not make that connection between the, 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 the influence of uh, the design and iconography on the posters that were produced around mid-1970s in Yugoslavia, oh, in that uh, a change of the politics or changes in the politics of uh, remembrance, where the, 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 the young generation um, which couldn't find itself or position itself clearly or, or precisely in those politics uh, uh, were actually looking for their own heroes. And those own heroes were found in the young revolutionaries, as for example, Ivo Lola Ribar, who appears in the several postings relate, related to different youth um, congresses, conferences, and so on. And I can't help but the, the, the way those posters are designed reminds me strongly to, 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 to uh, iconography and design of Ospel. And it continues also through the 70s, which I think it was very interesting that you had that conflation actually between the, 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 the image and, uh, and, and, and the meaning of Che Guevara with some of those young revolutionaries that uh, enabled such kind of reconnection of younger generation with the, the, the revolution. I, I mean, at this point, it's just my construction that should be elaborated and based on material. But I think that, um, I think Miguel was mentioning that alternative ways of, ways of, of, of uh, communication and, and geocultural spaces, which such kind of connections strived and were developed, but remained quite, uh, quite invisible due to the official cultural policies. So just a comment, thank you. Wow, but that, what, that's amazing what, you, what you're telling me. Um, I'm very interested on in reading about that. <laughs> I don't think anybody has written about that here yet. <laughs> But you will, I hope. Okay, yeah. uh, and it, thank you very much. It's very interesting because, um, well, there was this, um, I think, um, what I mentioned about the protagonist of Argentine artists at the Atelier Popular is partly, I think, a construction by the French artists. And there was this um, uh, fascination with the third world uh, let's say, figure, um, subject, this third world sort of uh, new men. And well, Che Guevara was, well, an emblematic case, but it would apply to also to other people coming from South America. And so, uh, and uh, the, as far as I understand now, 
uh, these three Polish designers visiting Cuba were very um, well known and, and 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 very good ones, of course. There were professors at, at the art school in Warsaw, uh, some of them, maybe not all of them, uh, and but there were maybe an older generation of uh, of uh, of designers. So it's it's so interesting to think of the affinities also uh, in terms of generation connection, so, something like that. Um, yeah, just just still, still one objection: the the the, the uh, corpus that should be also look uh, searched here in, in in former Yugoslavia. I think is the corpus of the posters produced by the. Um, uh, international uh, societies of international students that had their regular cultural activities and presentations. And it would be interesting to see if there is a reflection of OSPEL on the material, visual material they have produced. Sorry, now I have to break, I have to, to take my transformer or my computer will go. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was so, so interesting. I hope I could go and, and go through those archives one day in the future. Hey, Sanya, while Liliana has gone to get her transformer, she was going to give me two minutes and I might as well claim it now, right? Please, uh, go yes. ahead. So um, I'm going to try and put in the chat uh, our call for pay, and I've succeeded. Our call for papers. I mean, after this wonderful event, I was thinking, how can we how can we, we can't possibly do better than this, except that we hope that at the end of September, we can have an event which will be hybrid and some people can actually join us in the city of Rijeka uh, between the 27th and the 29th of September. Uh, and if you're really good, we'll try and organize a trip to Bruni. Um, so, it's basically looking at the same things. It's basically trying to think through counter hegemonic world making and emancipatory practices in, in a non deterministic relationship between politics, culture, and economics. Um, and we want people to look at issues around racialization, uh, Bandung, tricontinental, pan Africanism, pan Arabism. We've invited and they've accepted Vijay Prashad from the Tricontinental Institute, Sarah Salem from the London School of Economics, and a conversation between Budimir Lonchard and uh, Tverko Yakovina. But crucially, and this is why it's in the chat, we have a call for papers where we really want to accept 10 to 12 different papers on aspects of this and uh, on aspects of non-alignment and cultural politics, decolonizing culture, practices of cultural exchange. So this has been such a wonderful two days. Uh, we hope that we will see some of you in, in the city of Rijeka at the end of September. Please share with your networks. So I took the opportunity to claim the space, Liliana, when, <laughs> when, you, went, when you went for the transformer. So I shall give you the space back. Thanks, thanks, Sanya. Thank you very much. I was intending to invite you because you are the author of the concept of the conference. And thank you for inviting everybody to join us on that occasion. I don't know if you said it was with a hybrid, hybrid between Zoom and, and uh, in vivo presence. So uh, at, uh, at the end of the conference, uh, Barbara was supposed to wrap it, but Barbara has some academic, academic uh, uh, um, obligations which you couldn't miss. So I will just close this wonderful workshop with, with a few sentences. First, let me take to Sanya, thank for, to Sanya and Tihana for successfully organizing the, this workshop and surviving those very high temperatures. I could not <laughs> survive today. And uh, in particular to our technical staff, which allowed re researchers and cultural workers, whom I suppose were the main public of this workshop to follow the presentations both on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, I would like to thank, thank in particular to all the participants for this, uh, for their very interesting elaborated presentations. And um, as this workshop was described as a research workshop, 
um, and positioned at the beginning of our project, uh, it has proved, it has provided our research group uh, groups both, Slovenian and Croatian, with very important historiographic information, but also with very useful information on new concepts and models for approaching the third world art and visual, visual culture and exhibition practices, and also pointed out that perhaps we should extend in the media sense uh, our research towards a new media art and television, exactly. The television is a very in interesting, I'm sorry that we don't have, uh, Miguel just started to, to say some very important things. And I think, I'm sorry that we don't have time to develop that, that uh, role of television. But concerning the number of questions, both on methodology and media scope um, of, of uh, our research raised by this presentation, uh, I hope you would not mind if we shall contact you with the, the lot of the questions which, which we didn't uh, have opportunity to, to ask you. And also, I hope that we could establish and sustain the exchange of information uh, with all the workshop presenters, but also with the people who were attending this conference as uh, listening to this conference and participating in our discussions. I believe that it was David who stressed yesterday that the importance of the teamwork. And since the objective of the Project Globe Exchange, uh, objectives of pro our projects are very ambitious. You, you can see that from this description on the website. Uh, teamwork might also assume a development of the broader network of collaborators from different locations and different disciplines who might contribute to our research, that's it to understanding and explaining the nature of entanglement inseparable from the very idea of non-alignment that Nancy was speaking about yesterday. Uh, what we are offering, <laughs> due to uh, intense involvement, uh, the political and economical policy of non-alignment, NAM summits, inter-summit meetings, conferences, and number of NAM common initiatives, as thoroughly described in the archival collections to different Yugoslav federal uh, bodies, but also in the archives of museums and galleries involved in the practices of cultural exchange, <clears throat> which might be of interest to the researchers engaged with different aspects of NAM. <clears throat> Some of that archival material will be described and accessible to the Globe Exchange database. So you would be able to use it hopefully at the, at the end of the next year. We are also working on bi bibliography of non-alignment, including rare and gray publications on its pub uh, political, economic and cultural history, produced both in Yugoslavia and other NAM countries. And it would be great to have your support in developing that bibliography that would be um, uh, in, available both in print and which is most, more important as a free open access resource. Um, and um, I'm, since, since, since Paul already did his <laughs> way of <laughs> concluding the conference, so I will, not, I will not give him the word again. I will just say that we have touched upon the relation because between economic and cultural policy policies of none through, through mentioning several times the problems with infrastructure, uh, with investment in culture and so on. So it is a very important problem that we hope to discuss in September. And since it is, I don't know if Paul said, sorry, Paul, that the conference is actually conceived as a, as a, as a series of round tables. So I'm really cordially inviting you who are dealing with culture, visual culture and, and arts to join us at this round tables. Uh, we don't have, we have a limited budget, but for the people who we, will need our assistance, we shall try to find the money to bring us to Rijeka if, it is, uh, if, if uh, you can come or of course allow you to, or, or provide you with a, with a technical framework for joining us through Zoom. Thank you once again to all of you. It was a really pleasure meeting you. I really hope that this, is, this might be the kind of developing broader network that we are counting on. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.
See you in Rijeka. See you in Rijeka, yes. <laughs> Bye. Start writing a sutra. <laughs> 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 that, that you must see you 